Good viewer, you are watching Exzertas. This is because Exzertas makes you feel good, makes you feel fulfilled. You are enjoying this. You will continue to watch Exzertas for a long time to come. You want to subscribe to Exzertas, and you will. You will like and subscribe and share. You will tell your friends. Tell your friends about Exzertas. Your friends will come to like Exzertas. Much as you are liking this right now, as we speak. Thank you for subscribing to Exert Us. See, that was easy. Oval Office. What's this? What's that? You're John Paul Larson. Yeah, Good I'm JP Larson. What are you wearing? What are you wearing? What are you wearing there on that uh on that wall of yours? <laughs> um, so that this is a shape that is commonly found in the Book of Soiga. Uh, something I brought up in the video yesterday. It looks like the ships in Tron. I like it. <laughs> Look at this man right here, sucking on a wheat thin. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Pretty good. You're looking pretty Welsh this morning, you know. Welsh. What you that's mean? my new. That's my new catch. For, like, if someone's looking good, like you see a girl, you're like, "Hey, you Welsh?" Because you look oh, amazing. Okay. So do pick up line. You know. You like sheep? <laughs> <laughs> so how you been? How you been, Lukey? I'll be good. I mean, uh, five minutes ago, I was I was just walking down the street, and this van pulls up. Five Russian dudes pull a bag over my head, pull me into the back, and here I am streaming with Andreas. So it's the rules. Mm, just how it goes. Well, it's the early. But they gave me this, streams. so I'm okay. You know, they yeah. gave me this. He said, "Sit down." You talk to the man. You know, it didn't sound like that. He said, you sit down. You talk to Andreas, and then you enjoy this. Yes, you'll enjoy stream. You enjoy. And you then I, I said, "Okay, I will enjoy stream." Thank you. Stay chill. Stay. It's weird when Russian guys say stay chill. I always found that kind of adorable. Yeah, it's a, it's a good job you can't see the laser pointer on my forehead. Well. It's making me uncomfortable, but. I, I called the stream the early birds again because I kind of want to have an early morning stream, but there's no such thing because it's 5 p.m. where you are. So it's the early birds of the evening for you, you know. Yeah, I thought it was my day off. You know, I I, I woke up. I was like, "Oh, there's some beers. I'll grab those. I don't need to stream today." What's the dog doing on his day off? Not mm. lie around. That's his job. But uh, that's why I'm I'm in my puffy jacket. You know, well, I was I was out. This is a dumb. I, I drink in the streets. You know, obviously, I don't I don't drink at home. I just I walk the streets with beers in hand, looking at anyone that might stare at me weird. 
like Kate Middleton. This is a dumb conspiracy mm. that we brought up yesterday. As Americans, I felt like, A, I didn't care because yesterday was the first time I actually committed Middleton to my name and my memory. The name Middleton had not been stored in my brain yet. Because I Do you not remember Pippa. Little. Uh Pippa? Yeah. 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 No, Pippa, 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 Pippa was yeah. I don't. Who's Pippa? She was like, did she have an affair with him? Which one was she? No, no, Pippa's the sister. She just had a great ass. So at the, the royal oh, yeah. wedding, all the cameras were pointed at her ass. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, some yeah. of these Gaelic uh, derriers are, you know, in their own form. Although, I don't know, man. Some of your, some of the, uh, some of your women. Type, type Pippa Middleton ass, and you, you'll see what the, the media was on. I about. have moderate search on, right? Just one second. I got to make oh, okay. sure. okay. Yeah. Uh, I really keep up with none of the royal family. My wife, on the other hand, would understand everything. Really? Okay. Oh this yeah, is this a... is what it was all about. This is what it was about. Yeah, that's it was nice. Uh... I feel like that's kind of a that's well, that... slightly better than Taylor Swift. That's all we got going on there. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that, that was what the media went the for. One? Okay, that's right. Yeah. Well, I think it's relatable. People are like, "Hey, look, bigger is better." You know, some of that. Exactly. That's, is that her? Is this her showing her booty? So clearly, this was all part of some sort of like a media plan. To say like big ass Pippa. booties are good, mm. big ass P Pippa. Okay. I mean, they're not generally from experience, but there are, you know, so an confused. engineered meme. It's an engineered Tavistockian meme to make breeding happen between middle class white British Labour Partyists and Tories. Yeah, is that what it looks like? I mean, that's what I got out of the bald king, right? Because like. He's got this look now, like your upper middle class British yuppie. They look like your most boring suburban British people. They don't look royal anymore. They wear like normal outfits that look like they're from Pasadena or Los Altos. To be fair, have you seen him when he had hair? Then the man was pretty gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. When he had hair, he was he looked kind of like his mother. But now, like he's assumed the role of his father. It's like kind of sad. Yeah. No, he looked all right. Like, but that's the other thing. Like, we talked about this for a second yesterday. Diana, tennis coach. You know the conspiracy, right? This is Diana's Princess Diana's tennis coach. So, there's a lot to be said about that, <laughs> right? Like, why is there mm. such an ostracization of Harry? Because Harry's like so much clear. Like, so much. It more could just also be because he's ginger. Yeah, that's true. But they're all kind of they're, they're they're both kind of ginger because they got the Spencer blood. Well, okay, people don't know about England very much, so that's why I was asking you because you're, you know, you're kind of a, a a victim of the culture, so you know about it. Like, what do you think's going on? Because they're saying Kate Middleton's been Princess Diana by the son of Princess Diana. How likely is it that he's killing his own wife just like his mother was killed? Like, what do you think? What's really going on? Is Kate Middleton? I, I think this is a load of nonsense. To be honest, just like trying um... to get us to memorize her name. Yeah, no, genuinely, I think I think there's a load of nonsense. I mean, yesterday I went onto Twitter. I hadn't been on in a while, and uh, I saw a load of people telling me that King Charles had died, and I realised that they were a day old, and you know he, he hadn't died. Um, and then I, I realised that this is just all part of the same kind of group, isn't it? You know, they just want to manufacture the nonsense. Same trolley troll bullshit. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it damages the movements as well because you you'll find that a lot of the people, for example, I noticed a lot of Tartaria, uh, especially history related groups posting about it, and it's like if you're if you're posting alternate history, and you get caught up in this kind of stuff, it just makes you look a fool, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, if if, right, if yeah. you're sat there promoting, you know, Kate Middleton's been replaced with a body double. I find it the worst then... if you're as an American, because like when Americans talk about, it, like that's why I was even hesitant to comment on the situation because it's like, why? How dare I hate it? I hate when Americans talk about the royal family because it's like so many levels of of ignorance away from the object, and Americans love to to vain pretensity, like that we know what's going on. You know, so imagine like when you watch. Super Bowl Sunday. You're like, oh, how hilarious. This is the Americans uh, sport event. This will be like a cultural it's kind of interesting how Americans behave. But with Americans, if we were to watch like cricket or something, they'd be like, what the hell is this? And then they'd pretend like they knew what it was. You know what I mean? And that's what I feel like is going on with the royal family thing. They're like, obviously I know what's happening. It's like, but you don't even know her name. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, is I mean, in, in Britain, 
there's definitely a clear divide. And I'd say most of us don't care about the royal family. I'm anti-royalist. I don't believe in that anyway. I can tell from your accent. Um, thank you. The, do, you do, believe, get, do you think that there's a, 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 more of a, a yearning or you know people who want a disconnection and that's why this is gaining traction more or less? Yeah, right. Like they're like, I mean, dude, well, maybe she's missing, and people talk. Well, there's about more her, people yeah. who, are, you know, are less pro royal, you know, and just like pro whatever, you know. Well, I'd say the loyalists are more. They're usually more right wing. So, in our country, we have the conservatives and then Labour, obviously. But Labour aren't really left wing. It's. I mean, you, you guys have a similar thing where your left wing yeah. isn't really left wing. You don't actually have a left wing option. You have a right wing or a, a slightly less right wing, um, and then you get the centrist left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And our left wing isn't left wing at all. It's uh, entirely funded by the Israel Party. Like uh, the, the amount of clicks between those two is is insane. Um, that's why if you look at what happened with Jeremy Corbyn. He was completely taken down by the um, by the Israel lobbyists, and there's a great documentary on that. So there's many parts into it, but it's Al Jazeera. If you look up the Labour Files by Al Jazeera, that goes really into that, and it's brilliant because it just shows how deep the Israel lobbyists are into the supposed left wing of of the British uh, political establishment. Dude, and... meanwhile, I had a cousin who fought in Iraq, and when he found out that I was like doing CNN podcasts and like back years ago, you know, like 2012, like talking about Al Jazeera and things as an American military guy that early on, he was so upset. Like, he's like, we're fighting against this. So, that's the other thing is like people have divided themselves from this sort of data. They don't want to know this exists because they think the source, I mean, Al Jazeera, it's a funny name. <laughs> well, I think to go back to what JP said, um, I think the media probably is capitalizing on the fact that there are a huge contingent now that wants to move away from the roy uh, from the royals. And yeah, in particular, think... you know, people were talking about King Charles being the last and then maybe, you know, uh, go going down to Prince William being the last kind of thing. But it's, it's never really going to change. I don't think anyway. Um, yeah. They, you don't got... think it's way different than it was 500 years ago or 100 years oh, ago? No. Well, right. The thing is, you've got to remember about this, is that the king hasn't had power since, uh, realistically, it's, it's, it's hard to put an exact date on it, but the king hasn't really had power since the 1700s. But if you want to go even earlier, you could say the king hasn't had power since before then as well. Because you got to remember that uh, we had a civil war in Britain in the 1600s, uh, Cromwell took over because people thought, right, this king is he's not doing a good job and we need to take over. But that was funded by by bankers in the city of London. What kicked that off was that some MPs had, had done some trouble and the king wanted to arrest them. And they ran into the city of London and the city of London shut their gates. And the king was outside going, open the gates. And they were like, no, we're not going to open the gates. And that's what caused the civil war was they amongst the other bankers. Things. Well, amongst other things, well, that was the the kickoff that's a good, point. Was, that's a good kickoff point. But yeah, yeah. Also, but the, so you're was, saying the was, kickoff point was, the, was it's your was, country. Keep going, going. No, so yeah, you're saying the kickoff point was 1600s and not 1200 Magna Carta. Yeah, I was well, going to say mean, the Battle of Hastings kind of introduces like, or was okay. that just the original influence? Well, I mean, this because yeah, you're a native. <laughs> it's, it's it's a very long topic to go into because I mean, Sorry, I as, a slob, uh, as a slob, but, I would go back a, lot of... a thousand years. I hear you. Well, I mean, because because British history goes a lot further than they say. So you've got to remember yeah. that in the in the 1700s there was a huge Anglo-Saxon kind of. Uh, vibe that came about because they Versus wanted the to Germanics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They want they wanted to say, look, we're all Germans, really. We're all and it, to be fair, those Germans are Scythians, but that's another topic. <laughs> kind of so they 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 just sit there going, look, we're yeah. we're Germans. It's fine, you know. We he's a German. We're a German. Really, look, we're Anglo Saxons. And yeah. I mean, the original history of Britain goes back hundreds of years. I, I'm going to have a, a review coming out soon. There's a woman that I did a uh, an interview with last year when my channel was very very called Marshall Abrahams and she's just released a new book which I, I'm going to get a copy of and do a review soon on these uh, migrations to Britain one of them was in about 1600 BC-ish and it was by the Assyrians so yeah. under a, a person called Albine and then that follows up with uh, the Trojan migrations under like Brutus so 
after the Trojan War, the Trojans left. They they a lot of them migrated to uh, to Italy, which became the Etruscans, the you know Etrurians, and then they became the Romans. And a party of them, basically, Brutus's story is that he his mum his mum died in childbirth, and he then accidentally killed his father while they were hunting. He had a bow and arrow, yeah, and he accidentally shot his dad with a bow and arrow. And <laughs> er, the, the the Etruscans were like, "Get out! <laughs> yeah. you're, you're a cursed child." And there'd been a prophecy that he'd kill both his parents, so they'd been like, "Oh my god, he's fulfilled the prophecy! Get out!" Right. So he 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 went back to Troy, and he found a load of the remnants of the trojans troy had been destroyed loads of the trojans and they recognized him as uh, as a descendant of ennius uh, yes. ennius the trojan and they were like oh okay well we'll come with you then and uh, at the same time there was supposedly a load of the tribes uh, a portion of the tribe of israel called the the cumbri or K- uh, kimberi uh, from the kimaroi kind of uh, element and they, they were there as well so they all got on boats traveled to lemnos in greece where the the greeks basically built them a fleet and sent them all the way back to uh, sent them to Britain. So they sailed this fleet around to Britain. And that's how the the British were associated with Brutus, and that's why London originally was called New Troy. And a lot of people don't know that, but it it was originally called Nova Troia, and yeah, the, that, that's for the very reason. Yeah, and because the Brit, because just because the Romans were imagining Troy as their origin point so it was like we're building our new atlantis but our new atlantis is new troy because we're the romans yeah well that's the thing though but that these guys weren't really romans yet so after yeah. you've got to imagine you know four or five hundred years pass the etruscans have now gone and the romans are replaced yeah but caesar knew about the british this is why history is a bit falsified because they say that the british were just these celtic tribes they're just hmm. Celtic tribes, and they didn't really have much education, or you know, they didn't really know. What oh, they right, about. like the idea that they weren't because they have they're hugely connected tribes all over Eurasia and Africa, even right. So they're connected peoples. And connected. But I mean, even more, the fact is that these people are the same descendants from the Etruscans. So you got to remember right. the Romans are calling the British uh, uneducated, but they're yeah. from the same people. Yeah, the they're, they're not age. saying that they're bad genes. They're just saying they have bad education. They're uncivilized. Well, uh, in in a sense, but they weren't claiming l- kind of publicly that they were connected, even though right. Caesar himself yeah. knew yeah. that they were. And he he yeah. said it in his own works that we're go- we're trying to take over the land that Brutus went to, uh, because he saw it as Brutus is one of our descendants. So therefore, these lands are technically Roman already. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, because right. he's one of us. He went over there, so now we've got to go and conquer them. And they're just us who are just uneducated. But the thing is, is what people don't realize is Caesar actually failed. He he invaded twice, and both times he got sent back. And uh, he he writes, "Oh, they, you know, they're uneducated brutes." But he, he failed his invasion, and he got sent out of the country twice. It wasn't until uh, you know a hundred or so years later that the Romans actually successfully invaded the south of England and then slowly moved from there. So Caesar himself, he never got anywhere. Um, and that's because there was this British history and this British empire that was started, you know, uh, Londinium, as they uh, they might call it, was was New Troy. And it was a big city, a big castle. And they couldn't get anywhere. They couldn't cross the river. There's loads of info that you can read about. It's actually quite interesting. And they talk about the battles, how uh, the British had placed wooden stakes in the crossings of the river. So the Romans rode their horses across the the river and, <laughs> and they, their horses are getting staked. And then suddenly the British all emerge on the other side and, and uh, ambush this them. This is the most cool interesting things. wiki yeah. article ever because it doesn't have like the woke debunking section that's like, none of this is true and that we've decided that anyone who believes <laughs> this is a white supremacist... <laughs> You it's know, because like, they can't. Is it is well? The thing is, it's not. It's not accepted as official history. No, yeah, it's it was, a medieval legend. But, okay, go back. Well, to it sleep. used to be until <laughs> I can't remember the exact point where they threw all of this out. But originally, if you go back to one of the oldest British documents, which is written by John uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth, that's from the the eleven hundreds, and that obviously lists us as being descendants of Brutus and etc. Um, you know, coming from the Trojans. Well, at some point, this kind of, this legend disappears, and they said, well, it's because Troy was a myth. They said Troy was a myth. It was just, um, you know, something that was conjured up in the mind of Homer. So, you know, it wasn't real. Therefore, all of British history must also, you know, of that is a myth. But then they found Troy in whatever year, the 1800s. They found Troy... But at that point, they didn't go back and say, oh, British history must be real. 
they just uh as people say they thrown the baby out with the bathwater, and at that point it was it was too late to go and get the baby back brutal man that's like uh so the entirety of british history is connected then to an offshoot of Etruscan society or in Gaelic and Etruscan society that like it went off there basically. Yeah. At some point. I but mean, they you can conquer use... the Picts or who were, were the, were there already indigenous? Cause people talk about the well, brown skin people that lived in England, right? Like, so, well, the Picts, as far as we know, are originally a Scythian tribe that were sailing across the North sea. They landed in, in Scotland and apparently they were just allowed to settle. And then they just grew from there. That's who the picks were. But they, not very tall, right? Like, weren't they short? And like, aren't they like a small group of people? The picks are usually the ones that are just, uh, you know, painted blue and stuff like that. I thought that, that the picks were brown, yeah. and then that they got eaten by the Celts, and the Celts were dying their skin blue. It's the picks that started with blue. No, not really. I mean, the thing is with the Celts, right? Is there's a lot of confusion about Celtic tribes because British people weren't called Celtic until 1714. Then it suddenly kind of appeared. The British people were Celtic, they were connected to these tribes, etc. But the evidence would actually suggest that they're not Celtic. They came from the same places, like you say, as the Etruscans. Um, and that they they were probably warring with the Celts as much as the Etruscans were. Whether or not Celts were in, in the country beforehand, possibly. But as we as I mentioned earlier, there were an was an Assyrian migration in 1600. So maybe that's where you come across the dark-skinned druids, or what you might think of Celts is possibly because we had an Assyrian, which is Chaldean, migration yeah. in 1600 BC. There's evidence that there was uh, mines in Britain that were being used by the Assyrians. So if you imagine where you know Chaldea is, Assyria, they were sailing their boats to Britain, had their own groups there, mining stuff and possibly taking it back. Dude, well, if you had blue people, I mean, that's pretty sweet. <laughs> pretty avatar, isn't it? But, yeah. you know... Their weaponry as well is very Scythian. Um, you'll very see Hindu sometimes. also, like the Hindus with the mustaches. Like you've seen all the pictures of like the, it seems to me also like kind of interesting. Well, yeah, you got to remember the Scythia in itself is quite a broad term because you've got in Scythian tribes, you can have Huns and Goths, which, you know, would definitely be considered more uh, East Asian, you know, coming from the Xi'an Bay kind of Xi'an Nu kind of tribes of um of you know north of china whereas the alans are also considered scythian and they are completely iranian so you've saying scythian in itself could just constitute so much because it could mean uh genghis khan or attila the hun or it could mean an iranian person and they're different you know what i mean so you have this turkic element which is very different from that east asian mongolic uh, element which it could both be described as Scythian accurately. And then when you have the Saxon and the Angles and everything that have moved into um, into North Europe in, in around just before the Huns have moved in, you've had the Saxons and all them move in. So they're Scythian as well. Then the Huns have come flying over and they've gone, right, fuck, jump over the water, <laughs> right? Um, and that's essentially what's happened there. But even if you look at, I think it's Hengist, um, but... One of them in particular, his name is escaping me. It might not be Hengist, but he sent back messages to Scythia to send for more Saxons because there was a civil war going on in Britain at the time. And the, the king in the south of Britain was like, hey, you guys are pretty good at fighting. Could you get some more? And they were like, yeah, we'll send messages back to Scythia. And obviously the historians have to say, oh, well, by Scythia, they meant Germany. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and that's where a lot of the the stuff comes from. But wherever I, the Germain, wherever Saint Germain was going to, or wherever that region, because like it's such an a, a ambiguous term at that point, what we call Scythia. Well, yeah, because it's or so, Scythian you, or German, or well, like you've got to remember as well that I mean, supposedly oh, the, the the Romans and Greeks supposedly called anything north of their empire kind of Scythia. That's what they say. So anything beyond. Trias in Germany. So obviously, remember the Roman Empire did extend into Germany. I don't know if you've got a map of that, but you can see Trias. It was considered like the third capital of the Roman Empire. We want map of and Germany. If... By the way, Sean Morris is here. He just got back from the 10th century France time. He had a fight in the you know Anglo-Saxon timeline war, like that movie timeline. 
Yeah, but I don't remember any of it because my memory is remeshed with my current self five minutes yeah. after I got back here. So only the government of that's Russia like me every time you know. I do DMT, so I understand. Hey, wow, I mean, Gleb yeah. made it too. So I've been really wanting to get Gleb on the show at some point, along with the, Luke, because Gleb. Hi guys, being, are you in Saint Petersburg right you. now? Are you in Saint Petersburg? Where are you at? I'm in Saint Petersburg. Uh, in Saint Petersburg. Man, Petersburg, I can't believe the internet uh, works at all. Uh, yeah, I'm on. Yeah, there'll be some glitches me? probably. Yeah, sometimes it's coming in and out sometimes, but yeah. But yeah, we were talking a bit about the Scythians, the Scythians, and the idea kind of of Oh, there's some brutal feedback. I don't know, I'm going to mute you for a second just while the feedback happens. Oh wait, no, is that not you? Yeah, that's cool. All right. Talk about the Scythians, right? Because the Russian, German, Celtic nomadic period and talk about the Rus right? Because the Etruscans, the idea that the Etruscans weren't the Roman people, but they were the Rus probably, because like the Etar Ruskin, before they were conquered, and you've got all these examples of Slavonian Gaelic art that's the same across the Mediterranean into the Balkan, into, you know, Russia, right? Like all the way, and this is the third um Ro the third Roman city is Moscow because it stores the remnants after everything is conquered in middle Christianity, right? So like the last kind of authentic look at it we have. Um, I would say that it's possible that there's a connection via the tribes of Israel because we know that the tribes of Gog Magog were supposedly sent over the Caucasus north, which would be into Russia. Um, we've also got evidence of the Kimaroi, definitely in those areas. And like I said, the tribes of Israel themselves had probably uh, kind of intermingled with the Trojans in Anatolia. So you would have had that mix of those communities happening in Turkey, uh, definitely before the Trojan War. And then once the Trojan Wars happened, uh, th at those point, those communities have split. So it's possible that some have gone north and taken the exact same uh, art and language and stuff north. And then they've also sailed to Italy, taken it to there, and then taken it to, to Britain. Like, it, we can actually trace this language to Egypt itself. You can use, there's a book, a great book, which shows how you can use the Welsh language as it is today to translate Egyptian hieroglyphs. And that's because the Welsh language itself is a remnant of this Colbrun, and Colbrun's a remnant of Etruscan, and Etruscan obviously is connected. And you can actually use the same Colbrun alphabet to translate Etruscan uh, Etruscan texts. So yeah, that's the book. Does Welsh have a similar root to that? Um, some Indian language, because they're both like they're they're essentially like both split in different directions, off of some sort of like Proto Aryan or something like that. It's, yeah, it's very possible, but I mean, I think the Aryans would technically be considered before this, but you'd have to speak to someone that's more of an expert on this. Unfortunately, the person who wrote that book has passed away, and the original mm. people that realized this also passed away because they're they quite old. But there, uh, if you get this book, it's absolutely brilliant. It shows you how this Welsh is connected. And like I say, it's a descendant of this thing called Colbrun. So if you look up C-O-E-L-B-R-E-N, Colbrun language, they say it's a fake um but it's definitely not we've got evidence of it in america um do it with uh, c o e l yeah they this here we go so they say that this dude <laughs> forged it called uh, yolo morgan they say he forged it but it's it's not a forgery this is a real alphabet that that sign there that you can see which is like a triangle it's called the arwen um it's if you go there you go it's in the middle you see the arwen symbol of inspiration it's also it's kind of like a secret symbol for god so these guys are definitely related to the tribes of israel this language came over from that area with these people and it definitely comes from egyptian so you can trace the route that they've come from egypt with with the groups that have left with the exodus they've gone back to where they've gone they've gone into capture under salamansa and all that with the assyrians they've left They've gone on their journeys and they've some of them have ended up in Wales and you can follow that language. It's absolutely brilliant. Crazy. Also, Gleb, where are you at? You're walking around St. Petersburg right now. What are you showing us? Uh, I'm glad to meet you. 
but uh, some person I like the my morning and face breakfast. now. At, at, oh yeah! Wow, yeah, good. you see this one classical subject. So I should used to be the. Oh, it's like a uh, baptism. Is it like a baptism? Like a holy water? Piece. A holy water fountain. No, no. Or this one is uh, for. Uh, used to be the, this guy. The owner of this house was the main guy from uh, of the knights uh, or czar uh, division. Oh. Of the knights and uh, in uh, it was in eight uh, something in the beginning. It's legit. Uh, so, uh, and he. Oh so, man, we're gonna have to get you better Wi-Fi. Uh, language. Uh, um, uh, sorry, I was outside. Sorry. They don't have five G in Saint Petersburg. Yeah, yeah they might not have five G, but they do have well, Tartarian well, monuments well, every five feet. Yeah, it looks cool. I mean, it's crazy all the stuff that's yeah, going on in Saint Petersburg in terms of Tartarian architecture. Tell us everything, Sasha. Nice. Yeah. Well, JP, you were about to say All something right. to you. I have to me. go. Maybe I. Yeah. Okay. So, well, I'm yeah. stoked that we so got to see St. Petersburg just, at night. Yeah. Let's let's do this again soon. Peace, Gleb. Yeah, Gleb's cool. I'm sorry that we didn't have 5G because it would have been sweet to have him walking around St. Petersburg because sometimes he'll walk into like cathedrals and like the buildings and go down the stairs and stuff. So we get to see a lot of the different architecture in Russia, which we, is pretty sweet. We should try if he's going to be doing a walking tour, maybe like set it up. So you see if there's like a, an internet connection consistently around the, the path he's going to be going. Yeah. I want to get Luke and him to talk about uh, Russia. I think that'll be important. It'll be interesting. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> yeah. Now that he, the St. Petersburg syndicate is not on the stream, at least we don't have to watch what we say about Russia anymore. So he doesn't just like disappear. <laughs> No, you can say. No, you still got Andreas, man. He's he's, he's sticking him on at you. We can still talk about Russia. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, exactly. I think this no, is. Right, I mean, I I, yeah. I, I could <laughs> I could uh, drive around uh, a bit later, so we could just take a look from the on the. That'd be outside. cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Sweet. On the river, right. and there... it's a very. All right. Interesting. Well, We'll have to talk it's, about the inhabited. The narrative the says uh, seventeen isn't like nothing to do with that because you can see this everywhere. We'll have to we'll have to get better Wi-Fi. That'll be like the thing. But this is not bad. I can see. Yeah, all the basements, everything is built uh, up to that level. Oh, he just disappeared. But yeah, we'll talk with him more at some point. You can talk about Russia. Talk about Russia. Last time we talked about one of the reasons I wanted to get him on was because Luke had all these opinions about Russia, and it was really funny because Luke will go oh, like, I was for an just hour. Saying, it's really obvious that the origin of the Russian people is there are a bunch of Greeks that left the uh, beach to go into the mountains. Either they were did it Actually, really a lot, Greek, a lot of Ro a lot of Russians believe that that's like an official yeah, no, look, narrative. There's a lot of evidence in their culture. First of all, take a look at Vladimir Putin. Give the guy a tan and a Hawaiian T-shirt and imagine him explaining that he's opening up his third gyro restaurant <laughs> in a very thick Greek <laughs> accent. He's, he's obviously a very a, a Greek who hasn't seen the sun in years. All right. Oh, Second of God. all, you take a look at the, le the letter they use for P. All yeah. right. Like wait, that's wait. obviously pi. Third of all, the tradition of military homosexuality. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that actually... But the Germans do that too, and the Germans spot aren't in love, as they the call. Germans aren't Greek. The Germans are Turkish. So I don't know. I mean, like uh, the Germans are Slavs. Well, I mean, not in the military. <laughs> I mean, <if> <laughs> wrong. Yeah, don't tell them that. But you yeah, know. no. It's I like mean, saying yeah. telling telling an Israeli they have the same DNA as a Palestinian, but they do. Well, this is what I mean. If you go into German World War II stuff, they were pretty proud of obviously you know German nationalism, but they were proud of being Huns. They were proud of being Teutonic Knights. You know, they that was their thing. Like, come on, you're the descendants of these great invaders. You took down the Roman Empire. You know, you were crusading. In, they were invited Poland, into the Roman Empire, and that's they how were, they took it down. Are you they were me? Romans. Yeah, that's the thing. They were Roman citizens. Most of them are like <coughs> remnants of Roman settlements on top of, of old Germany. You know, like all these, all, well, like, all of Germany is built on these church towns. Church towns are built on old Diana and Apollo temple sites all over the place. You've got crypts underneath the churches. That, I mean, the entire uh, Middle Ages wouldn't have been plausible 
if it weren't for the fact that people were building their villages on top of aqueducts, on top of old um, cysteines, and on top of the uh, wells and you know the the plumbing systems yeah. that the Romans had left them. It's insane when you think of. about it. The Middle Ages was literally built on the ruins of a previous civilization, and they had no understanding of it at all, almost. And the, the Christian Church made a specific point as well of building all their churches on top of the pagan sites. Yeah, because that the they also adopt a lot of uh, the pagan traditions. Well, but, yeah, that's the that's part of the uh, indoctrinating those people into the system. You know, if you replace their church, you've got to bring them in, haven't you? By being like, oh no, 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 it's still the sun god. Don't worry, it's still the sun. Yeah, god. yeah, it's, it's not a god, god, it's not an angel son of on the their god. Hours. It's the same idea. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, which earlier, earlier, I just wanted monotheism in general is it's like the first form of globalism. Wait, before like the, before the we lumb into the fold, so the Egyptians brought them into the fold. Before we lambast Atonism and uh, Akhenaten, let's uh, Akhenaten, let's uh, let's talk a second about Luke's transgressions against humanity and his own hypocrisy because I find him adorable. Luke Last time, or Luke the writer, Luke here on the show, Ancient Historia. Last time we were on the show, oh, yeah, I didn't know your a, name. Sorry, he's a decent bloke. Uh, last Thank time you. we were on the show, you know, and this is what most of my friends will do about their lives. They'll talk about how much they'll criticize for an hour their own country and all the problems. Very good. You know, talk about all the issues with it. And then we'll get into another country and it's just like, oh, but that color is purple. You know what I mean? So like Russia, uh, you know, for you to be like, I hate what's going on in England, all this stuff. And then but like all of a sudden it's like, but Russia is so bad and Putin's so bad. And then it seems like you're falling on the on the sword of British Atlanticism is the solution to defeat Russia, right? Like, that, like so why, well, how, how are you picking that side? Just because you're English or what's the deal with that? Um, well, I mean, first off, I'd say you're taking two points that are unconnected. You know, I could complain Me? about my, right, I can complain about my living conditions and that doesn't mean that your living conditions are better or worse. They're unconnected. They're different things. So by me complaining about Britain, that doesn't have any contrast or any any kind of you know element on what i'm talking about when it comes to russia and the only thing that i've talked about when it comes to russia or what i did talk about on your channel last time was their possible motivations for why they might have manipulated this tartarian narrative to suit their needs which is what i went into i discussed how it would benefit them in moscow to keep the people in the east in siberia thinking oh we were all one nation forever we were always one giant nation it was never us the kingdom of siberia it was always the kingdom of russia and that's good for them because guess where most of russia's soldiers come from from the uneducated east most of the populous educated west who live in moscow and these regions they're all fine they're enjoying it but the people that are dying in ukraine are coming from these poor regions and most of them are muslim so I noticed that a lot of the stuff, for example, you can look at David Ewing Jr.'s work, it's consolidating this Muslim element, bringing them in and saying, no, no, the Quran talks about it too. Don't worry. Yeah. We all had this. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's a new I was world order it. optics agenda, but it's for everybody. It's definitely. Yeah. I know. I never Russia. discussed the specifics yeah. of Russia and how people are living in Russia. I just talked about why the Tartarian narrative might have been manipulated to turn it yeah. into what it is. Well, I mean, in a sense, you're not wrong some people. because Russia is definitely using the Tartaria. We've talked about how they're educating their kids. This guy, Gleb, is walking around St. Petersburg showing off all the buildings that he finds to be Tartarian looking. So clearly, there's like a consciousness of Tartarian tartaria going on there the difference is moscow is not saying that they're the originator of tartaria they're saying that they're the inheritor because no one else has stepped up to the plate to inherit tartaria and so all of the groups that are interested in uh, a world alliance a confederated kingdoms ship where everyone ha every like where siberia is a kingdom and bolivia is a kingdom but they're all part of tartaria the, who's looking for that right moscow is the only place that seems to say hey we acknowledge that this is something that we could work towards again, right? And that not everyone else is doing that. So, of course, Siberia is going to say, yeah, well, we should work with Moscow, even though Moscow admits that the origin would have been in Kiev or in, uh, you know, Georgia, you know. <laughs> Wouldn't that be akin to, like, if the United States had a lot of a heavier Native American element and they were kind of starting to say, like, oh, well, this country is, like, the same well, thing isn't that's it, been going on isn't for 5,000, 10,000 years. Isn't already what we're doing with the Greek uh, and Roman continuation? America's like, well, we're the natural continuation of Greek democracy, you know. are we? What, what, are we... I, what I would understand <laughs> to what you just said is that Tartaria was never 
one giant country. If you were to actually right. take the country of Tartaria itself, it was definitely more around Mongolia. There's a debate over whether it extended <coughs> up the Northern Ocean, but that could be down to the European cartographers having absolutely no knowledge of the Northeast and thinking that right. everything beyond Lake Baikal was the Scythian Ocean. It's totally right. reasonable. So the the point that I'm making is that whilst you have a Tartarian Empire, which we would could today consider the Mongol Empire, which splintered into the different, you know, uh, Golden Horde, Chagatay, Ilk Khanate, uh, Northern Wan, etc. You know, Kublai Khan obviously took China in his during his period of the Golden. So you can consider all that Tartaria. So, but what you were saying about splitting things up during Tartaria, even in Fomenko's model, there was a Tsar of Siberia. So even in Fomenko's model, there was a ruler of Siberia who had just as much power supposedly as the ruler at the Tsar in Moscow. So even in that model, Siberia has a say. And that yeah. was what I was getting at. The the current model is basically tricking people who don't have because you gotta remember, Siberia's history was destroyed. As far as we know, in the official history, it was destroyed during a campaign of uh, destruction from the 1500s to about the 1800s. Uh, uh, you know, they moved across, they destroyed the Cyber Khanate in 1586, they replaced it with Tobolsk, they moved their own people, they captured the Sibersky family, which was the, the Cyber Royal family, they moved them to Moscow, and they, they that created the House of Siberia. They were basically imprisoned in Moscow and said, you know, stay here, you can't go anywhere, you can't be kings of your own place. And that's why if you look at Putin, Ugachev's rebellion. This is a dude from Siberia, or well, from the east, who who thinks himself the rightful heir to the throne. And Fomenko turns this and says that Pugachev's rebellion is, uh, you know, part of this Romanov kind of expansionist thing. Uh, whereas if you apply it to actually the history as we know, you could say, well, maybe Pugachev was a descendant of this cyber carnet who thinks, wait a minute, I should be king of this whole area. And that's how they've twisted the history because they don't want the Siberian people to know that they had their own uh, their own history. Uh, Tumen in Siberia is one of the oldest cities in the whole uh, of Russia. They have their own history. Go to Semipalatinsk in Ka uh, Kazakhstan. They have thousands of years of history, and it was all destroyed when a Russian fort replaced it in the 16 to 1700s. And you've got the same story across that entire front, right? If you go to any of these cities, when does it say the history started? 16 to 1700s. When? Because a Russian fort was built there. But everything before the Russian fort appeared is gone. Everything before that, no, nah, no, nah, there's nothing here. But Russian fort appears in the 1600s, country founded. You know, you got, did you get what I mean? You're muted, Andreas. Yeah. yeah, I get that. There's definitely an, an erasure of the world culture. And it gets worse under the 20th century, right? With Stalinism, you have the... Um, but also, you have a kind of a benefit because Siberia is refilled with all of the disenfranchised, all the people that were uh, in intellectuals that Stalin was worried about. He's like, well, I don't know what we'll do with intellectuals. Just put them in Siberia. So Siberia did end up... Like Silicon Forest, all of the major tech um out of russia not all of it but a lot of the major tech out of russia comes from the silicon forest which is in siberia and nova Sibirsk. so they do have i mean they're doing all right like in terms of like of russia nova Sibirsk is probably one of the nicest places to live you know and st petersburg clearly looks pretty good so russia itself well, so though is more of a federation than it is a country kind of like more akin to the united states each Exactly. region is like an oblast and then each oblast has like those, those different administrative districts that are actually i think more like size like united states states it's almost like a collection of countries and cultures that have all come together and just said we're going to operate under this common banner and they do as far as i understand maintain some sort of independence between each other to an extent there's rules still so what's sad is like all right so they've taken the worst ideas from us so starting with the soviet union the soviet union had a really amazing constitution it doesn't mean that they followed they, they, they it the idea but... from us because well they've so been doing the, this yeah lot longer. so so the the soviet constitution is almost identical to the united states constitution it just has more rights in it they just never enforced them but there were these ideas of more rights that were written directly into it because it was supplemental no, no, this is written after beer after ours but also federalism so we were a confederated country and the soviets were more like confederations and eventually they realized that's not going to work by especially in the 60s but during stalin's period uh he controlled each oblast and said this is going to be for military purposes this whole city is going to be building these kinds of things and you're not allowed to talk to anybody or leave 
and well, that's that, central planning central planning led to closed cities which today there are still in russia and the russian federation closed cities where you can't just go from one place in russia to another place in russia without a visa like you know, right. so, seven like if i wanted to go from like san francisco to los angeles i might need a visa not necessarily because it's not that bad to go from st petersburg to moscow but in general if i were to try to go to Nova Sibirsk to Silicon Forest. It's, I think, still a closed city that you need to have permission to be in that city. So there's a lot of examples of that for military cities in Russia and a lot of places which were not on the map until satellite positioning. And now they're on the map. And they're like, yeah, they exist. Just don't ever come here. Right? You got to remember yeah, as well. The, the so oh, sorry, man. But uh, the, the Soviet Union did do a lot of the damage in terms of history. We don't actually know what was destroyed before, what was destroyed after. The, everyone brings up that CIA document that mentions Tartaria, but there is, it is actually a great example of what they were doing. Because when they came into power, one of the things that they did was they motivated the Muslim population. And they were saying to the Muslim population, look, we're on your side. Yeah, we're atheists, but you're okay. You know what I mean? We're not going to do anything to you. The minute they got into power, oh, stuff started to change. Mm -hmm. And they, and eventually, especially when it came up to World War II, they were essentially doing their own version of, of the Holocaust on the Muslim people. And yeah, I wouldn't expect them to treat Islam any different than Christianity. As well, it, you know, for real, it gets, it, it's never talked about, but the stuff that was going on with those people is, is ridiculous. And they completely erased what is most of Central Asian history, you know, from uh, what was originally the Khanate of Bukhara, Khanate of Kokan, Khanate of uh, Kiva. These are all places which were considered independent Tartary before the Russians invaded in about the 1850s. Uh, they'd been trying for since the 1700s, but they finally got uh, finished it in about 1860, 1870 or something. Is and the concept of Russianness a nationality or is it an allegiance, though? Uh, well, well, at this, at this point, Russian I'd say it's an allegiance. There is a Russian nationality, but there's also an allegiance for the Federation in the same way that America is a Federation. But Russia was, I mean, there was less of a russian allegiance before the soviet union and the soviet union right. did create an ideology which is you know the nation of his hip-hop the nation of communism like anyone can be a communist right right but like the russian federation itself goes all the way back to like the 1500s uh, but it was it history. wasn't yeah but it doesn't it doesn't include a lot of the states that today would consider themselves russian so this kind of reminds me of that. It's not entirely. I mean, of course, we have a lot more freedom here. This is just when it comes to air travel. But this thing, this this was supposed to go into effect like two years ago. But the pandemic pushed it back. Really? And what yeah. was this exactly? What is this a real uh, so, ID thing? This is, you basically have to go get a passport connected to your driver's license. Um, I, I think that this kind of went over a lot of people. And a lot of people aren't ready for this. Um, this is something that you know, was done legally uh, a, a decade ago, uh, kind of quietly. Explain. What did they do? Well, they you can't get on a plane without a chip made, made in your that, passport. Well, yeah, after you get on a plane without an ID, period. Unless you're yeah, an illegal yeah. immigrant. In this case, yeah. they're 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 not giving you a choice to to track your you know analytical. So what happens if I own my own plane, though, right? Like, can't you do anything if you have your own private jet? Like, you know, you know. still have to go through TSA. I've been on private charters yeah. before. Yeah. Uh, bummer. They have, it's, it's a lot faster. It's There's a lot no faster, line. Yeah. You're on your own airline, essentially. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Interesting. Still, the idea that you have to go through TSA. I don't know. Well, I mean, the idea of, like, security in Russia is interesting because a federation is different than a confederation, and that's caused a lot of problems. For instance, um, tour uh tar it seems like they're gonna do this with planes first i mean what's to stop them from trains and buses and cabs and well like i just meant like example like tartar stand which we've interviewed have license just to drive a car you know we've interviewed people from tartar stand yeah well, basically that's already that's already happening if you have a fruit that would suck in. right <laughs> Tartar stands cool, and it's a state in Russian Federation that really is its own country, right? And these are the examples, like, how much are you going to be allowed to be your own culture? And it looks like Tartar stand has um, wow. rebound a lot, you know, to be – it's – it's this is where a lot of this culture comes from, right? Like, this Reminds idea. you of Basque country. It is really beautiful. 
Um, yeah, and you can see like the Slavic culture. Tatarstan's amazing, you know, and it's but it's a state in the Russian Federation. So some would say they'd prefer to be a country, and like a lot of you ask a Tartar, they're gonna say, "I'm not a Russian. I'm a Tartar. I'm not from Russia. I'm from Tartar. I'm from Tatarstan." So yeah, you- they don't they don't look at themselves as Russian, even though that they're happily part of the Russian Federation. Right. You know, to go back to something I, I was I was going to bring up, but you guys started talking, so I tried to mentally note it, and it's only just come back to me, so it might be a bit late. But when we're talking about Siberia, if you go to the documents around about the time of the invasion of the Russians, some of them do suggest that the Khan of Siberia was still under the yoke of the Sham of Cathay. Now, Cathay, of course, referring to not China, it's being like the remnants of the Kitan Empire, which I would consider Manchuria before they changed themselves to the the Qing dynasty. And well, they became the Manchus officially, but they were the later Jin, became the king. But that area was called Cathay because obviously the Kitan Empire is Kitay, Cathay. That's why, uh, in fact, Russia has the Kitay Gorod Wall in Moscow because, well, it's kind of weird, but it means Chinatown. But yeah. So. There's a lot of evidence that might suggest that the the empire itself was situated in Manchuria, and there was a second sham, and that that was the the guy that was actually ruling Siberia and stuff, kind of as vassal states. So that that would definitely be a reason for the kind of Fomenko mindset to move it to Russia instead, because they like to say that all that area was just you know. Part or of the I mean, no, because it doesn't. It's not about where the area is necessarily, because there are people that live there, and eventually they want it back. But really, it's about a nomadic people. And if they lived in Manchuria, there's a plague, there's a war, and they move west, they're still the same people. You know, like it's 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 as if uh, you know a lot of Israel was created out of London and New York, right? So it's similarly, people don't have to be from or in the place that they're trying to go back to like their culture or, or that they want right because like russia's be been relocating like people from one land to another for they god that was so long like, yeah nothing- definitely the, the deportations uh yeah deportations are not deportations. deportations are definitely something that has come up in like history they had another I mean, trail of tears every 20 years over there 100 yeah. percent. i mean you even go to the crimean war you know that's a, definitely a dodgy one but basically the entirety of europe teamed up to help the Tartars against Russia in that one. Um, what year was that? I want to say 1783, but I might be wrong on that. So they're nomadic, right? They're moving around. Their capital is obviously mobile, correct? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, it seems like that's what, what the tabernacle represents. Every picture you see of Tartaria, they're using tents. These giant... What happens tents, but... when somebody wants to settle down and say, this is where this is where all of our people are going to capitalize on this nation idea from now uh, on. Uh, why would you do sorry, that? Sorry, the, the, better, the, official, the better, the better sorry, thing to do. It was 1853 yeah. for the actual full-on Crimean War. 1783 was like earlier battle. Um, but the the main the main point of that kind of issue is that russia at that point was expanding everywhere i think everyone was worried about this because russia had grown so large they were moving into central asia i remember the the afghans were were making a lot of deals because obviously britain at that point owned afghanistan and a lot of the afghans were okay to to join forces with the british because they saw the russians coming and they were like oh yeah go on then (laughs) we'll actually allow the british to you know take over just to stop the russians kind of thing and and i think it just shows that it's like the South Park episode, isn't it? Where you say we've got a choice between, you know, a turd and a douche. Like, that's essentially the choices of all these people. You've got the British on one side, absolutely plundering Afghanistan and India. And then on the other side, you've got the Russians doing the exact same. And you think, which one do I choose? It's pretty much the situation we're still in today, honestly. Like, well, you've got that, Russia trying like... to expand east, uh, westward. That's, that's kind of the point I was trying to get to. But it's supposed to be a good thing. You're supposed to have two empires that confederate. You've got a land and sea power. The sea power does trade between the land power. The land power sets up port cities. The port cities are interacting with the sea power and the land power. And then you've got, you know, the land power has nomadic tabernacles. The sea power has nomadic se- uh, sea vessels, right? Like, you've got... it almost feels like there's three empires struggling against each other in the current world though we the people because what who's the third the the old roman empire doesn't seem to hold the united states i feel 
like the traditions of the Roman Empire are alive and well in places like Spain and Latin America, where they have things like inquisitory court systems, where the judge actually picks through all the evidence and decides whether or not you're guilty. In the United States, we have an adversarial court system. It's based on British common law. And a lot of countries in the world are following that example rather than the Roman example where, you know, like if you were to be accused of a crime, you'd have a prosecutor and a jury rather than the judge just looking through everything, deciding whether or not you're guilty. There's a lot of big differences between Roman systems and British common law systems. So they might be aligned right now, but how long will something like that last? And if you look, all most of the Latin influenced countries, including Southern Europe, follow that model. I think that you're correct in the sense that the model is not going to last because information is so clearly recorded. And that I also don't think it's that different. That's you know. They do have court like that, you know. Uh, what is it? The uh, the magistrate courts do that. Yeah, right. But and like also, you, you have to think about. We know where side Latin America is going to fall on the like in for, the future. I would say I would say all of America is kind of a thing. First off, and then we all of all of Roman culture and all of uh, Arabic culture are not a thing. They're not like monolithic. So Roman culture had different states that had different rules, even though yeah. they had a Roman imperial system. And you had different rights for different classes of people, including people that were from different conscripted countries or they'd given up their rights to become citizens. You also have the Roman Empire becoming the Holy Roman Empire, which is a completely different thing. But before that, you have the Arabic thing. And the Arabic thing is a kind of Sharia law system. But in Spain, they developed what really napoleonic law is based on because napoleonic law is saying well we have to have everything written down we have to have order well maimonides did that first so there already was this idea of statutes in arabic law that we became very familiar with and that led to the european Amurabi did that first well that's fair you could say babylonians but the point is the arabs <laughs> brought it to europe the arabs brought it to europe and then hey, afterwards is. oh sorry sorry i, I was just last, gonna ask how long yeah. we're gonna go for just uh one another hour is that good well, right. I was just because I might stream it to my audience if we're going to do yeah, it. Yeah, do while. it. Good. How could you right, not sorry, stream sorry it? Sorry to interrupt. So sorry to How know. dare you, British yeah. man? No, should, should we all just pretend like we've just started? I, I just don't want to yeah, say, yeah. say that Look, we're in a not. dichotomous world where there's only two th there's Russia versus everyone else because there's oh, yeah, the yeah, Russian yeah, yeah, Empire, wait. the British Empire, the Roman Empire, and the Arabic Empire. And we're yes, the clueless. Arabic Empire is multifaceted and decentralized and just. Since streaming before the hour begins, because that'll be really cool. Because then that can be. Like, yeah, I will. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so the Russian. What's the Give me. A, uh, give me a I've been name. calling it the Exertus Early Birds and Goals. Is what I called it. But you can call it whatever you want. You can call it like how Russia is cool. You can say how like British people are learning to be more like Russians. I don't care. Whatever. Okay. But I think that's what uh, this whole Ukrainian. Ninety nine ways about. the Welsh get laid. I think the Ukrainian war is really about preventing Russian expansion westward because they really would love to make everything all the way up to the west coast of Europe a Russian oblast or two. Wait, hold on. Okay, we didn't get there yet. So the Arabs had their uh, law system, which is very much where the Napoleonic law system came. But also, oh, yeah. they had their And which Sharia one of these law laws would you like to live under really hold does on. affect your quality and not, style we of haven't even We haven't even got it. So we had that Roman law system, right? But now we have this Arabic law system and we haven't gotten to the Napoleonic law system yet. First, we have to have the Holy Roman Empire's law system. The Holy Roman Empire's Catholic law system is based on the Sharia law system, right? Because it's using this idea of Sharia and God's law, and you can't always know all the law. So we have all of those simultaneously that are existing. And in Latin America to North America, you have corporatism, fascism, uh, Bolivarianism, you have Bolivarian socialism. And yeah, I think corporatism leads to Romanism. So you have a Roman... You think streaming? Cool. All right, hold on. <laughs> Watching Ancient Historia. This is Luke's stream. <laughs> Brought to you from America. Okay, we're good. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so lo lo law system so yeah i think uh the other thing to understand is america exists as a collection of states and this really began after in the 19th century late 19th century after we invaded the philippines and we realized we should just have a bunch of countries that we own right and so wait, wait, wait. our law isn't... system started in the year 1000 with the magna carta okay but if you say that then their law system is really weird because we have social contract theory, 
which states that between two mutually agreeing parties, you can make mm -hmm. an agreement. So the Magna Carta is at gunpoint, a man is forced to surrender his rights without any sort of agreement, right? He's forced to do this thing. It's not mu two mutually agreeing parties. Yeah. If you right? want to exist here, you have to consent to be governed by us. Right. So the Magna Carta isn't, I mean, either it, it, it either it is or it isn't like the most important like we can get into anarchic philosophy, but I prefer to live <laughs> among a population that is governed. Why? Why? Because then I can predict what people are going to do. It's not random. You can't it have isn't... business without predictability. Mm, I don't know. Like, so like, I feel like in Japan, in the movies, at least when in the 16th century, like they kill each other with swords, you know, like the Edo period uh, to the 18th century, they're, they're so much more polite to each other. Because there's that potential that they could get stabbed. You know what I mean? It's nice to be yeah. rude sometimes. Right, you know, right up to the point where like they that. were introduced to firearms. Yeah, right up to the point. Come on, okay. when somebody honks at you, you don't look at them and say, your horn blows, but does your mother? Right. Well, that's yeah, another yeah, so it's... After so that, that's... it took all of 40 years and their honor was gone. That's another interesting point. So you'd think that in New York City, where you have lots of people interacting with each other all the time, and people get murdered all the time, that people would become hyper-civilized because they would become more British than British, trying to be polite to each other to not get killed. Why is it that it works the opposite? No, I don't think that people in New York would become polite with each other just because the culture exists not to be. You couldn't just hand them all swords and expect them to all be perfect angels. That would be insane. No, but like if everyone started murdering each other, wouldn't you try being more polite to not get murdered? It just seems like you know, no, maybe I think you not go there. stronger to not be get murdered and be able to murder other people faster. I mean, that seems like the I think you'd be able, humans. I think you'd be able to run a countryside like that, maybe not a city. Do we have a double historia? Oh, okay. I was like, whoa, there's two ancient historias, but it's just your it's your screen. Tell me about this. You're muted, dog, on your own channel. Oh, no. I did not just do that. Um, anyway, yeah, this is just because I need money at the moment. You know, ancient historian needs to upgrade to super historian. Oh, yes. And, yeah. Yeah. Give him some British pounds um, for this map archive. That's cool yeah, one. yeah. So basically, I thought, like, I, you know, instead of just ask for money, which I, I could usually do, I thought I could offer something in return. So this is my entire Tartaria map archive. Some of them, most of them are in such high quality that you can zoom in to a man on the ground. Um, maybe not that high quality, but close enough. And they're absolutely amazing. So if you're a Tartaria person that wants to either research more or you want to start your own channel or something, you know, this is the go-to because this will take oh. you hundreds of hours, if not thousands, to, to find all these different ones. So if this is something you're interested in, definitely think about hitting out because you're going to support the channel and you're going to get access to a gigantic archive. So consider that. Aren't we all a little Tartarian in a way? Like I've got, I found out that I recently, I recently found out that I've got a little bit of Basque Arab DNA in my blood. And I feel like that is connected to that. If I remember correctly, right? The Basque are based. They, uh, they're, no one knows exactly where they come from, but their grammar is identical to the Japanese grammar, which is really That's weird. Wild. Yeah. But the Basque are cool. And like, um, uh, I love Basque country. When I went to Spain, I walked across France into Spain. And so I had to walk through Basque country through the Pyrenees. And there's this old book, the song of Roland about the Arabs and the Christians at that time. Cause Spain, you know, they're Muslim yeah. and Christian and they're crossing the Pyrenees mountains at night with ponies, wild ponies. And now today I was, that was in 2012, 16 different years. Um, there are still wild ponies. They're just lost in the mountains because wow. they were just abandoned and they've like evolved to be all hairy and crazy and cool. But um, the Christian peasants and the Muslim peasants would work with each other to cross because the Knights Templar, the elite, and the Ottomans, the elite of the Arabs, were working together to tax and, and exploit the peasants on both sides. So it's an interesting story because you're looking at it thinking like, oh, this is especially the 12th century. It's supposed to be a story about uh, Christians versus Muslims and this you know, religious war. And really, it's the story of peasants working together on both sides of this rel ambiguous religious argument between it's like animal farm. Like you can't tell the difference between the pigs and the men, you know. Is that and then I guess that the, that all of that is the reason my beard is so thick. Could be a thing. Also, that's the really good food, like really good food. They, they excel at that. But their language, dude, super weird. Like, uh, people need to study the Basque language a lot more. Do you think that they're connected to the Welsh? 
Do you think that's what that's what's going on, Luke? <laughs> well, actually, now that you've talked about it, yeah, they actually some of them are. Um, it, during the the migrations of Brutus, they supposedly stopped off in in that region oh. to pick up some of their fellow tribesmen that had been there from earlier migrations. So it would suggest there is a connection. You've also got to remember that if you bring up kind of the the Gothic Visigothic Empire in Europe. You'll see that there is a big center in Portugal, Spain, Lower France, but essentially loads of the Goths and the Vandals and loads of other Scythian tribes ended up in Spain. There was migrations over the Pillars of Hercules into Morocco and stuff like that. So, yeah, 100% there's a connection there, uh, so particularly like between the North East. African. So it feels like these small nomadic tribes that, you know, went all over the place with their own little plans had more of an effect on history than the people sitting in the thrones. Mm. Well, I mean, you, they call them small tribes, but this is the thing. Mm -hmm. If you go back to, I think it's Honorius and Arcadius, the, the emperors a uh, certain period, they both had generals that were their advisors, but they were more than advisors. They were quite literally the people that told them what to do. And one of them was Visigothic, and I think the other was a Vandal. So Honorius is, is one or the other, so don't quote me exactly, but Honorius had a Visigothic or Gothic uh, general telling him what to do, and the other one, Arcadius, had a Vandal. So what else you say? Oh, they, you know, they were just nomadic tribes. They were ingrained in the royal family. And if you look at the, the battles that took place in the three to four hundreds, you have... Uh, Magnus Maximus, he comes over with with his father. They they take over a big portion of the empire, and you get them coming over from the east. The the in the east that rises up is it's all barbaric armies. They he goes around gathering them all up, and he says we're going to have to fight the um, the British essentially. But they don't say it's the British. They call him Magnus the Usurper because obviously they ended up winning. So it's it's kind of been twisted that way. But if you notice, the, the before Attila the Hun even turned up, they were already well ingrained in Roman society as high up generals and stuff like that. And then obviously because they're high in the army, they'd marry into royal family. So the minute that, you know what I mean? If you're a top general, you might be offered like one of the, the princesses or something. And that's how they got themselves into the royal family itself. Calm down, Luke. Don't get too excited. <laughs> yeah, and then as they become a uh, prominent minority in this in the culture, once the homeland shows back up, all of a sudden the uh, old old parties start up again. Pretty much. Mm hmm. Man. So, JP, what are you thinking about? What does that make you think? You're muted. <laughs> we've all done it I'm, I'm, ab I'm absolutely stunned um, I'm learning more than I had hoped to learn um, I've told you before that I wasn't going to watch a bunch of videos about all the Tartaria stuff I was going to learn it over time and I'm regretting that now So, because I have nothing to say <laughs> oh no well you know a lot about history though and so anything even if we're going to like be like well actually here's our take on that Like, well this is the take that I, that I haven't really cross-sected yet so but you've thought about england and you thought about you know i know you think about like the royal <laughs> like lineage of kings i know that's like something you think about my history goes back a little bit further you know how about my... that Kate milton though <laughs> <laughs> think she's alive <laughs> full circle again oh man like, oh, my God, like, they're so bad at this. Like, holy shit. I really think that she's fine. She just has something going on with, like, maybe her neck and her face and she doesn't want to be on camera because I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. I just think but, that like, she's probably annoyed at him because he had that affair last year. And it's like, she's like I don't too. have to go on camera. Screw you, you know. But I don't, like, again, with the caring, I'm trying so hard. Like yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Like, oh, let's God, let's not let's not even talk about it because uh, it's it's not the I, kind of thing. I man. don't even. It's not even like the royals. I, I'm concerned for her personal well being just because she's a human being. But I'm How also you know? like laughing at these people because <laughs> like if Queen Elizabeth was still alive, she would not be letting them clown themselves like this. 
how <laughs> how is it possible that the prince is not Banksy? I'm so convinced more and more. Banksy is an M16 creation, dude. Yeah, clearly. I mean, I think what it is, he's like, look, you're guys, you're my security guards. You have to take care of me while I go in graffiti because I'm the teenage prince. And they had to eventually just like come up with a way to keep it safe. Dude, what, yeah, what else like, is Banksy than like the mil the British in mind control, but probably from the freaking prince himself. Yeah, no, they let you get the ca enough counterculture to feel like a radical without actually threatening any of their interests. That's what Banksy is to me. Yeah, that's what it kind of feels like. I don't know. Uh, also, the idea of the kings is interesting. Talking about the Visigoths is interesting because you know, you know, mentioning like, the Visigoths and the Vandals, like two two great bands. Uh, they they're so colorful, and uh, the idea that they were so culturally connected to the Arabs with their bright colors, like the idea of wearing these, you know, green and yellows, you know, things that were associated with like the Arabs. No, it's Mediterranean well, it's, it's, in general. Even back in the ancient Greek statues that we have in perfect white marble were painted in ridiculous pr bright primary colors. Yeah. It's, well. it's debatable as well where that um, kind of comes from because we've got stories that originally when the tribes of Israel went on their exodus from Egypt, well, when they you know, decided we don't want to be slaves anymore, the Egyptians asked the Scythians that were in the area to give chase. And there are stories that the Scythians said no and instead they moved to the west and ended up forming like a, a kind of conglomeration on the north african coast so there's debates over whether the scythians came in then but then also what i was talking about before with the vandals and the visigoths there was a period in the late 200s early 300s where as the roman empire was starting to fragment we had an invasion of these vandals into france and there was a battle going on. So basically they were fighting the Romans on their eastern front. So they, they were in France. They were fighting the Romans on the east. And they were also fighting the British who were coming in uh, over the coast. And they had fights with the British who were kind of Roman remnants as well. And they got sent. It was by a dude called Constantine, but he wasn't the original Constantine. He was another Constantine. But um, they had fights with, the, uh, with these vandals and stuff. And they sent them south to the Pyrenees. They All the survivors, basically, they'd chased them south and they were there they said right go into spain and we won't chase any further and at that point the guys jumped over the pillars of hercules which is at um you know kind of going over into north africa and they moved into the carthaginian empire and that's where they kind of took their house in carthage and they became the original pirates that fought the romans and i don't think they got they got rid of them until the 500s it was the eastern roman empire i think i want to say one of the justinians i think maybe is is the one that took down the carthaginians and then they ended up migrating to ireland after that but for a while this spanish element was connected with north africa and i think that that's just kind of held for hundreds of years i mean if you look as well there was an iberia in the caucasus there was two iberias one was in the caucasus and then obviously the one in spain i did not know that were they culturally connected or did they just happen to have the same well i, I I'd assume that they're culturally connected, but I haven't been able to see too much on it. Iberian has a very, very specific lineage. If you were to look at it, there's even a uh, like a, a distinguished like jaw and cheekbone structure among those peoples. You can kind of see it in my face a little bit. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the mad thing is, is how history repeats, because even if you go back to World War Two, you had uh, Moroccan uh, migrations over, you know, to, to the Franco's kind of establishment and hitler and all that was we were assisting them actually and it, and it just shows that this element this north african connection to to spain has stayed for over a thousand years crazy barcelona is also like the best nets guy song by the way if anybody listens the best who song nets guy nets guy i don't know who nets oh guy my is. god yeah all right, I'm in. Yeah, I can tell I'll be down. Oh, you'll love it. What do you think about the sandcastles? Whoa, that's a sandcastle? <clears throat> How no. tall is that thing? It's sandstone, but it's like a real castle oh. in, England, in Spain that looks like. Oh, that's why. Is that the one that they took like 800 years to build or something like that that they just recently finished? I don't think so. There's a bunch of castles like this that are super old. Um, and that trying to restore them is a pain because you have to sandblast them to get the soot off of them. 
And now that they do, they're like, wait, they're not black and ugly. They're actually like pink and pretty. Yeah. That's wild. Like like a castle or like a cave and things like that. What part of the world does this come from? Spain. Spain. Oh, yeah. It does look Mediterranean. Something that always strikes me about Mediterranean culture is that it really is is constant almost regardless of who happens to be ruling any particular region of the area. They really they might change the names of things, but they really keep the, uh, you know, the flavors and the, and the aesthetics similar, which I think is cool. Like Italian. I mean, it's, and Afghan it's, it's very Uganda, Gothic, isn't it? Is- yeah. The, the, it's interesting how much of Spain was controlled by the Goths, but how many of the Goths were Arabs. And so you have this geometry influence on them it's also weird like looking at people in the mediterranean because you have people that were clearly like super african and super blonde that had Mm -hmm. families you know like the cultures that like so there's a lot more cultural merger and uh integration and gene flow and just all sorts it's crazy to think about how much more communication there was between people because we got to just because there was like increased competition between like different like intellectuals in that area, like it may have accelerated the the pace of civilization at the time, just because I there think were so that many there different. Was... So I look at like specifically Spain, like cargo cult almost. You've got all of these people coming from other places, mm-hmm. and they were allowed that they were allowed to uh, flourish. I mean, there was there were far more wars back east. If you look at India and where the um, mm. like oh, West the actual India. Silk Road. Yeah, there's yeah, a lot more there's a lot more violence going on, and so Spain was a lot more peaceful at that time, and it became yeah, because really there's nothing on the other side of it, right? So it's kind of like how America or like Canada or something like it's just like somewhere kind of a little farther away, and so it was allowed well, the, to take data from all these different cultures, and they were you know another thing about the United States and the ge- and the geography here is that it doesn't lend itself to fractionalization like the Mediterranean area does not having any seas along the coast allows the central authority to maintain control over everything a lot more easily when you have something that like reaches back around as a peninsula and is like right across the water from you it's kind of hard to maintain control of those people around the back through the land and it's easy for them to project force at you from across the water so that's why i think europe has a lot of smaller countries and only recently federalized but the united states immediately did so when it got you know a transnational control system like railroads and telegraphs were the reason the united states was able to flourish so quickly and then europe had to play catch up they already had their in their ingrained think, system I, where it was- I think they got lucky. I think that the technology came up right whenever they were settling the vastness of the known west of America, and that technically they they took advantage of it. But then yes, everybody else was like, "Wow, this works. We should do this too." Yeah, but I think the grand acceleration of culture happened from the fact that there were so many people vying for you know economic and political control over the Mediterranean. And so, like, and again, there was, like, so much room. So in Spain, they had freedom and time, and they built these crazy – they'd find geysers, so they had access mm-hmm. to water. They'd build it a giant castle. And we go look at these things, and like, 20 – like, walls longer than you'd think. Like, the Great Wall of China across Spain. All of these counties that are just surrounded in these huge fortifications. So they had time to do that. And then also, once they were in those things – so even if this was built before them – the fact that they're able to live in those castles when they're attacked and sieged and they have water supplies again because mm-hmm. of geysers, they can, out, they can outlive any siege. So they end up doing really well. Um, this is the thing that like people will get sieged for three years at certain points. In well, were these, these counties operated by counts? Uh, so they were mostly by the the Amans. So you had like in the Arabic culture, you have like a religious order that builds up. Wasn't me. Oh yeah, sorry about that. That was mine. <laughs> I have all my other tabs muted right now. I'll send Raf the link. I think you Raf might join. Cool. But yeah, we can also but I'll be ready for Neuropa. I'm doing Neuropa right after this too. That's funny. Okay. But yeah, so like the fact that the castles were uh controlled by the Muslims meant that they had these huge uh religious orders and they allowed Jews, so there were uh in um was it Lorca and Heliorcus? Heliorcus is, is the city of Lorca in South Spain. They have these exactly. giant towers that are, they look 
you know, they're like obelisks, but they're towers. And then like people lived in them and then they had castles that were on mountains and they have an entire settlement where the Jews were at and that the Christians, beautiful. it was rad until the, the Christians tried to kill everybody in that. The Christians yeah. or the Catholics? The, well, so this is convoluted, but like they were Catholics, but the early Catholics are prototypical. So this is like after the Council of Nicaea, but before the uh, St. Arius um, struggle. So it's like really like 300s. You know, this is before. Uh, when do the, oh, when wait, do the Catholics no, it's, it's really rise? Like when when's the official? I'm, I'm not sure. When, when do we clarify this is Catholicism? I'd say if you're not using Fomenko, three. 29 or something like that because when, when uh, well council... 325 is yeah ca uh, council of nicaea with Con uh, constantine yeah. and so after uh, the council of nicaea about four years of war goes on and yeah, say Catholicism think... just means canonical christianity when you get into like ro like romanism and shit so like it's really just like what is and isn't when they started like official christianity well no no it's, right. it's more it's more like when did the when did the catholic church that we consider today inherit the tradition because they're saying yeah. we killed he's everyone wrong. else. Well, no, because you've got so first you have Yeshua, you have Jesus, he's alive, and then he's got his friends, and then you have witnesses of that, and they're called martyrs, and then they all get murdered by Paul, and then Paulines go on, and then there's this planting of Saint Peter in Rome, where there's no evidence that this is the case. And Paul was dying thinking that he'd completely failed, you know, because he didn't convert Rome. So it's interesting that we end up with a Pauline Christianity because of Marcion anyway. But then they revolt against Marcion. So the Christians, then you have like cannibal Christians. You've got psycho Christians that are in uh, Donatus, uh, Don the Donatists, which are pretty cool, actually. Like They're just saying you have to be pure to do the Eucharist. And then this other group of Christians don't like that. They end up in power, kill the Donatists. And you have uh, also warriors that join their sect because like they've kind of conquered the Donatists. And they're like, well, if you want to be violent, be part of our order. And you've got St. Augustine. Which who, one of these marched on the Sephardics of Spain? Uh, so after St. Augustine decides that he doesn't like Manichaeans, uh, then they kind of decide they're going to go to war after the Council of Nicaea. And that's when they start forcing people towards becoming, like, if you don't believe this, what we believe, you're not mm -hmm. actually a Christian. That didn't exist yeah. before that point. You could go to any different group of Christian, they were all confederated different churches with their own beliefs and they had their different gospels gospels was just what the good news meant so everyone had there weren't even books a lot of the time or there were books there were like hundreds of tiny books that were like this is this story of steve and jesus one time steve went to the beach simon and jesus you know yeah simon and jesus like eating a sandwich like all kinds of like crazy you've no idea like there was there's the gospel of nicodemus where jesus harrows hell he has to go down there and he has to fly and save uh adam and eve <laughs> Because all the people in hell, right, waiting for him. Jesus where you been? Was Jesus? a kid in school, and he he used his powers to blind one of his student, one of the other students, and oh yeah, and he didn't put him back until his mother made him. Yeah, there's one where Jesus kills the kid, and then he brings him back from the dead, or some. That other might be guy the same story him. with a different with a different twist. Blindness might be the light touch. There's some weird. There's some weird stories about Jesus that didn't end up in our Bible. And uh, yeah. the other thing is, there's I different like kinds of Jesus because they show that Jesus didn't start being a good guy because he was just born perfect. They said he started being a good guy because he realized it was easier to not be a dick. Well, so then again, there's like kind of like why the God of the Old Testament is mean and the God of the New Testament isn't because you know he came to Earth, <laughs> experienced manhood, and was like, oh wow, that's a lot harder than I expected it to have been. Preston says, be as long as the these guys. As long as the early birds don't crap in my car, I'm fine with this. All right. Thank you, Tristan. I appreciate the $10. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's different kinds of Christians. The Marcians, the Ebionites, the Marcionites, the Ebionites, the Valentinites, the Donatists. Like, so I think the Ebionites, I forget if it's the Ebionites, but they there's a group that believe that Jesus became the Christ when he was baptized. There's like he'd finally achieved Neo state. It's in the Matrix. Okay. He's like, I'm not the one. And then you're like, Oh, y'all are the moving one. into my topic now. <laughs> but not everybody, not everybody uh, believed that the Marcionites believed that Jesus was always the Christ. And then so then Arian said that Jesus was created and became the Christ when he was born. Because before I thought Arians born, didn't believe that he was the Christ at all. 
No, so that's we, and then and this is why they kill people because they don't know anything about Aryan. Right, Aryan because when, when we based. when we had the Council of Nicaea originally, yeah. uh, the story was that the Aryans, obviously not Aryan with the Y, uh, you know, with an I. Yeah, Saint Arius. Just to cl- clarify for anyone, yeah, um, <laughs> they the they were they were apparently angry because they didn't want Jesus to be deified, right? right. So the whole point of the Council of Nicaea deified, was obviously. It's... Well, Council of Nicaea was basically saying this guy's the son of God. He was, you know, God incarnate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they didn't believe that, and they were like, no. Right. That and was they were supposed. Dish. Well, they were supposed to have a debate on it, and I know that the the guys moved the the debate forward. So they said, you know, for example, we're going to have it at one o'clock, and then on the on the day they were like, actually, we're going to have it at eleven. And unfortunately, none of the Aryans had turned up. So when the Aryans did arrive, they they came and they were like, "Oh, I'm really sorry. We've already had the vote, and you weren't here." So, oops. And the official and the official story the Catholic Church tells is that Saint Nicholas Santa Claus was debating with Saint Arius directly, and he slapped him across the face. <laughs> and there's Wait, a big what? there's a painting, and I always think about this: Saint Nicholas Santa slapping the Aryan. <laughs> yeah, because he's like, "I how dare you believe this stuff." Um, here's the paint. There's so many paintings of it. Here's oh one of the. <laughs> here's wow. another painting of it. There's there's a lot of it. There's a lot of this going on. <laughs> this, I'm not I'm not kidding when I say that this is a story that people sing about. You know what I mean? Like, how could you believe that slap slap? <laughs> Look at this one. Oh my god, what's even happening? He's punching him in this one, and he's black. Wow, See? this is the most historically accurate one, ironically. Anyway, um, because yeah, San- Santa Claus was probably black. But at least, at least partially. Um, I mean, he spent a lot of time outside. He must have at least been tan. He was like Berber, Turkish, m- Greek from North Africa. Above you know? the clouds, you can he's got so much UV. Just, he's he's going to definitely gray. be gay. Yeah, it's possible he was this blonde, blue-eyed albino guy. I'm just saying the probability of that is lesser than higher. Uh, but the idea that Jesus was turned to the Messiah because he earned it is different. That's the I think again the um, the Ebionites. The Mars, the the um, Arianites, the Arians, Saint Arius, believe that the Son of God was created by God. So it is God in man, but it's not. Uh, it's still it's still restrained. It's still God, but it's not a different God. It's not a separate person, right? Really, it's the same but Jesus. But Jesus is the separate person because Jesus is a human, and so the experience of Jesus living and being in the human body and the conditions that restrain God to the flesh are very specific. And there's only so much that the human mind can fathom. And if you can say that this human mind is like perfect and this human body is like perfect, right? Cause then there would be different things happening. Like Jesus is talking to God, but God's not there with him in the garden of Gethsemane because it's probable that the human body cannot withstand being in the presence of God without dying. Right. And there's been certain things where like Moses was made to be able to see or hear God and these different things. But if that's the case with Jesus, it's taking away from the benefit of what it is. It's, it's, it's proof that the human condition is it's possible to do this thing, to be a perfect person is possible. And we're showing, it's not that there's a cheat code that God used. God got in the vehicle, God, God picked up the video game controller and mm-hmm. played the game and won. And we could all play the game. Right. That's the say that so, it won is very subjective. You know, it was I don't really know if we're, I don't know if we're there yet at that winning it was, point. And I would agree a hundred percent with JP that God, God Christ was murdered and it's not a win. <laughs> like when so, Jesus was in the desert, Satan made a very compelling argument for him sure to cancel the entire project of Earth saying, when he got but, back home. Wait, wait, the I didn't mean to yeah. say that says, was there was 13 people who thought that he thought that it was cool, that it was worth forgiving. Say, say it again, Sean. I didn't quite. I didn't so catch when you. Jesus was in the desert for 40 days, Satan made a very compelling argument to him whether for him to end the whole project of Earth when he got back home. And the reason he didn't do that was that there were 13 people he thought were cool enough to forgive the rest of us over. Exactly. I think that a lot, enough people do not give credit to the people that he encountered. Yeah. I think that there are more people he encountered that treated him badly than the ones that treated him. Good. To be fair, though, do, do you yeah. think we'd all be like that? Like, if you got to heaven and God was like, "So, what do you think?" Well, there was a there you was a person, end it all. There was a person who was so 
loving of this person that he betrayed him out of faith. That's horrible. Out of That's yeah, the thing. I mean, Most of Jesus' friends that. suck. Jesus' friends suck. Like uh, doubting Thomas and then the – or was it Simon, Peter? Who's the one who refused – like the cock crows? And you're you're refi- deny me three times. Is that Peter? You're denying me three times. Is that Peter? I don't Satan, remember. get behind me. Satan, get behind me. Is Peter? I think that it, it lends too much credit to the idea of the mark of the beast. The idea that that something cannot wonder. You know, he came down and he he, he met twelve friends, in my opinion, that were able to wonder, like he is able to wonder, and he said this species is definitely worthwhile. I'm gonna go ahead and say 13 because of that lady friend of his, Mary Magdalene, is pretty important for sure. But I was saying, fair, wouldn't friends, it be the same? The though? lady could... friend, Mary, and his mom. Yes, w- wouldn't mom. you? Wouldn't you feel the same though? Like if if they gave you the choice to destroy the world, and you're like, yeah, go on, then it was a bit of shit. But then they go, right, oh, e- even that. even your cats, and you're like, oh no, my cat's pretty awesome actually. <laughs> nah, go go on, nah, let them live. Let them live. And I think that's the way I'd be. I'd definitely think, yeah, destroy it all. It's awful. And then look at a cute little animal and go, actually, they deserve another chance. You know? Mind control. I don't know. I think the <laughs> idea, though, that it's not... Because um, Doss- sure St. Arius exactly was thing. trying to stop docetism. He didn't want people to think Jesus was like this bulletproof dude who felt no pain, who didn't actually... Because like it was starting to get that he way. Where feel people, pain Jesus to forgive us. They're like Jesus is a superhero who feels no pain and was awesome, and you'll never be able to touch that. But the original idea was like, hey, if we all start living like this, we can just forgive our debts of each other. And then they murdered a guy for saying that. And then they're saying, well, the murder of the guy is like a blood atonement sacrifice. So like everything got turned upside down really quickly. You know? You know? Yeah. I don't it's think funny that Jesus we usually murder people like that as a, as a species. Okay, I don't there. think that I don't think that Jesus knew what he was really capable of. I yeah. think that God, whenever he came down, I, I don't think that he would have said, "Okay, I'm going to know everything I know now." I think that he's going to say, "I'm going to give them a chance. I'm going to let the 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 avatar that I'm encompassing know what I know, but not know why." Do you understand? So he was able to save some people. He was able to use it for good. He was able to use it to save people that he knows, people that he meets along his journey. But I'm not sure if he knew why he knew everything. And I think that the reason for that would have been that, you know, he could have affected too much change and he would have affected too much um, conflict in, in the experimentation of what Jesus might have been for him. So, you know, I mean, I, to be fair, in the Gospel of Thomas, doesn't Jesus say people think that I'm coming to bring, you know, peace? And <laughs> exactly. Land, I'm actually I coming to bring so fire, so war, and destruction. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Oh yeah, what I what, 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 what for wrong. God is not always good for a man. Like God's plan doesn't always involve <laughs> perfect, perfect peace and everything. It involves whatever is going to actually happen. So speaking of that, actually, what do you guys think of the whole millennial reign theory? Maybe you haven't heard of it, but uh, it's quite, yeah, it's a prominent thing, particularly in the Tartaria community. They believe that, um, I mean, it does stem from Fomenko, but they believe that a thousand years have been added onto our timeline to erase the fact that Jesus did actually return and that the events of uh, revelations have essentially already occurred. When and you say thousand years have been added, would that mean we're actually in the year 1024 rather than 2024? Essentially, that's what they believe, yeah. Um, so the whole Middle Ages was just a, an invention. So it is a shuffle that's together. What they the shuffling I'd say is... from that perspective, I'd say you'd have to think from the God top-down perspective. Well, no, hold on. Just because to understand what that means. Because so, earlier we even said, like, you were like, when did this happen? Like 300 or 1300? Because the idea is that after... The, you know, we think of the fire of 1666, we think of the Roman occupation of, of, of Rome versus the Istanbul Christians, the original Constantinople Christians that had to leave during the Ottoman exodus, the simultaneous calendars, the lunar calendars of the Hebrews and the Arabs, the Russian mm-hmm. calendars, which don't synchronize with the Western calendars, which were used until 1924. And the 1924 calendars that they found that are synchronized very well with the Arabic calendars and the Ottoman calendars. And what it looks like is 
examples that we've found before, like the pseudo Isidorian decrees, which the, you know, their coffee stained forgeries that the Roman church created in order to pretend that there's a reason for celibacy in the priesthood. There's never been a reason for this. It was created by this fake forgery in like the 11th century. But again, this gets more convoluted because the Jesuit suppression, they were actually excommunicated. All of the Jesuit priests were kicked out of the Catholic church at the 1750s. And, and so they ended up for about a hundred years uh, secretly trying to take over the Catholic church again until they got back in, dug up the body of the Pope, burned him, took his soul out of heaven from a, they put him on trial and they took his cor his corpse. And then said, I all remember right, this. they excommunicated him. So they, then they burned all the books and they don't know exactly what year it is after that. And so then you've got all these examples where like the years are back and forth. So Fomenko, as you was talking about earlier, is a Russian scientist who granted the Russian government and the Soviet union probably made him write a bunch of, propaganda but he's also put a bunch of decent chronological evidence in that shows that events that we think of that happened in the 7th century might have happened in the 17th century and it's really interesting to imagine like islam and the american revolution being a lot closer tied together like a hundred years apart for instance the creation of modern islam and also this idea of proto-islam mm -hmm. what might have existed in the past before you know the 16th century what we understand but the third century being constantinople period and also the 13th century being the rise of uh, the Jesuits. It's really interesting in terms of the calendar because you can find just multiple events where these 10 lines of kings, birthday to death day, and the years between them are the same as these lines of kings, birthday to death day. Only they happen 600 years different, but they're 12 generations in a row, same birthdays and years in between them. And so you're like, okay, well, they just supplanted, the Catholic Church supplanted this story when they came to this place. And then they taught this to say, this happened here at that point, but it's the same history that happened somewhere else 500 years earlier. Yeah, it only takes one generation to, to totally rewrite the history of a, of a people. So that's right. not impossible if they were literally just transplanting myths from one place to another, if they wanted to see if the same myths would generate, I guess, the same type of, you know, society and having that much power and over that much time it would surprise me if they weren't experimenting with entire populations over multiple centuries right yeah sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you luke i just wanted to rant i had i missed i missed my ranting that's fun oh it's all good i was gonna say actually there's a great book that i read last year it's called uh you probably remember the cx the camera but it's called where is jesus buried put uh, it right in front of your Muslim chest bucket. Put it right over your chest and stand up. There you go. Where is Jesus buried? Oh, and it's backwards. Yeah. No, it's forwards for us. Yeah. For you. Oh, is it? Yeah. Right. Okay. You got to have your face in this frame so it knows what's your what is you. There you I go. See G Where is Jesus buried? Japan? Tell me more. No, it basically says that he was buried in I've Wales. I've heard that. Pretty in Wales. I could have guessed and made money. Yeah, that's guessed. just the English Japan. <laughs> <laughs> English Japan. Well, I mean, it's quite interesting. It's a very good story. It goes into uh, whether or not he isn't buried in in Wales. You know, debatable. But there definitely was somebody buried in Wales known as the Fisher King, and the Fisher King is connected, obviously, to to Jesus. So that's really interesting. Here's or, the what kind of mythology goes around that? Here's the theory, and that this is something that I want to try to use to bridge to bridge multiple sects of I think thinking right now. Okay, so they have you have you know, ultra naturalists that believe in telepathy and, you know, psychokinesis and connections between human beings or beings for that matter. Okay? Wireless. Yeah. And then, and then you have, you know, people who believe in ancient aliens. Okay. Why has there never been a theory that Jesus could have been born as multiple entities existing as the same entity in multiple bodies? Why is nobody like else? That. Isn't that like most like people? Isn't that Hindu Christianity? That's like well, a lot of the, the there new is age. That, that basis there. You yeah, know, there, but, there are Hindus it, who are Christians and they believe they, exactly they could that, have, that we're all Jesus deep down. Well, they could have killed an entity in Jerusalem and still that knowledge would persist. And that mm -hmm. person who is the same entity as the same physical body would be in all these different places and everybody would, would experience him after the fact with the same knowledge, the same experience. That's Why exactly would God Hindu not be yeah. that intelligent why would god not have those contingencies in place to try to spread that knowledge why would that not be the case why so is jesus nobody is the ever thought of this, 
Uh, there's been tons of people that have been saying they're female claimant. Uh, I'm sorry, female claimant. Uh, Christ claimants, like that, say that they're like reincarnations of Christ, but also I don't know how they're going to do that. I mean, yeah. as that as that when Mary produced Jesus, she produced at least up to eight other versions of himself at the very same time. <laughs> do you understand? Oh my God, if Jesus was off couplets, so one, one went to India, <laughs> had an one act. went to England. Everybody's learning at the same the time. Everybody's religion, pulling I'm all sorry, this information yeah. of all human knowledge at the same time. What's the probability? I think more of the idea, though, that Christ was saying is that everyone, like Yeshua, wasn't like Christ is his name, right? Like really Yeshua is like a Yeshua is like a Christ is title. Jesus like a was title. name. God is the God is the I. But no, it's a dude. It's a dude who said we could all do this thing I'm doing, mm -hmm. and so it's not like you gotta like watch me die and be grateful I'm dead so you can be immortal like a vampire. It's like if we all work, if we all do what I'm doing here, like not rocking the karmic boat. I'm gonna stop. Like if there's like this caustic karma and people are in trauma from it, I'm gonna alleviate it. That's literally there are a lot of positive things you can derive from the fable. Just so long as you get something positive out of it, I think it's done. It's but it's job. not supposed like, to be a fable. That's what's a bummer. Agree with that it shouldn't yet. be. It shouldn't no, be it a, just, fable. It's a fable. It should be like, it didn't happen. Okay, so like, what if you were a dude who spent your life not claiming debts, and your whole message was like, "Yeah, no, actually, I don't give anything out that I can't. I want back." And uh, that became such a big deal. Like, honestly, I think that everyone should do this. Like, we should just not. And like, money wise, we should just forgive debts because slavery. We should just forgive debts. And that became such a huge thing. And then they murdered you over it. And now everyone's slaves and everyone's banking and everything that you were against that you were trying to stop people from doing and showing them that you had a life trick that was good to avoid that. Like, that's not what they're focusing on. They're focusing on wearing like a picture of you that costs money and saying that like your blood will make them immortal. It's weird. It's not what Yeshua <laughs> wanted, you know? Like, it's not a fable. It's like it's a bro who was trying to tell you how to, like, forgive debts, you know, for karmic I agree, reasons. I agree. I agree completely that at some point in time, you know, the entities that had access to immortality were trying to guide humanity. And over time, they have not really accessed the right, say, influences to... Uh, you know, hit the goal on the head, you know, and things have gotten lost in the message. Like, it's really weird how distanced we are from the idea of being like this guy that we think is so great to be like. I also think, wait, well, I mean, the, about the, immortal, the immortals trying to guide us in the right direction. Like, yeah, that, that's that, that's an interesting assumption on its face because I'm sure that there are a lot of immortal beings who are quite jealous of humanity because we get to live and die <laughs> rather than just sit there static. <laughs> I'm more we get more to taste that, things. We get like to feel to things. We get to fucking eat. I'm more the and more I've heard someone say something that heaven depends on existence that we have more than the other, more than the other way. There's definitely like two. Imagine never tasting a grape faith. for eternity. That's what it's like to be an angel. Well, I mean, they do say, don't they, when the angels came down, they were immediately seduced by the children of men, you know? Oh, yeah. Immediately, like, oh, sure. shit, I did not realize the you guys were so hot. Like, yeah, because they can become something mortal, but not vice versa. They have to give something up. Y yes, they have to give up the immortality. Imagine the deep-seated jealousy you'd feel by looking at that. And as well, you got to think that Jesus himself and the Bible says usury is a crime, as in giving a loan where you take any profit. That's a sin. Any profit usury or extra profit? Is a sin. As in any profit. If you loan something to somebody, you should just get the thing back, and that's the end of it. So when you look at what we're going through at the moment in the economy, I mean, it's simplified, but you can essentially boil it all down to inflation from Rent interest seeking. rates, which are essentially just loans. And that's what it is, because, you know, every time they loan something to somebody, they're creating wealth and they create that wealth, which devalues the rest of the wealth in the system, because there the more of something you have. Yeah. And, and there's there's just kind of the, the system that they're running at the moment. And it just shows that. You know, it doesn't matter how much you read the Bible, how much you go to, to church. If you're still taking a loan, even though you're the victim in it, you're technically taking part in the in the sin. We're, we're a society oh, yeah, of sin. You the way that the Bible yeah. supports there's no, there's no sin. dealers without junkies. 
There is no sin that is more important than the idea that everything that we know now as sin could have been imparted on humanity at some point in the past, but there was an entity that chose not to do that because he was at some point otherwise jealous of the attention that this new entity was getting. It doesn't matter. The fact is that that entity has already been declared to receiving all of our responsibility as a species. In that, what do you there mean are a lot of responsibility. Hold in, on. In, that, in that, there are a lot of people who, who see that and have created themselves a character of themselves. You know, like like Charles Manson. I can see that he, if he would have come to that conclusion, he goes, "Oh, I can kill anybody, and I'm not responsible for myself." In the end, after hell, after you know, being you know, stored as an entity that broke the rules. So that's the problem with the way that inversion of Christianity, like Pauline Christianity, with cannibalism and everything else, and saying, "Hey, yeah, this blood sacrifice." This is a great thing, you know. With the death of this guy, you don't have to ever try to do anything good ever again, right? That's the exact opposite. I'm pretty yeah. sure. Of the, and then the Romans the take a pic, take take a, a a picture or a statue of him nailed to the fucking wall and point at him and say, "This is what we do to people who talk like that." <laughs> you don't like well, the money? Get out. So that's true. Yeah. The version of that message hey. eventually that becomes you're like, hey, you know what? That's awesome that, that happened to that guy. I want that to happen to me. But I don't think that that lasts eventually. Yeah, forever. Well, I mean, this, you you can even see like the way they've kind of twisted things that we talk about now. So this is my interpretation. So feel free to tell me that I'm wrong. But um, yeah. <laughs> there's one there's one bit in the Bible where it's it's talking about um, you must not trade in the temple, right? Yeah. And and Jesus gets really angry because you're trading in the temple. And it's like, this is an insult to God. You shouldn't trade inside the temple, trade outside the temple. And I feel like that in itself is is kind of a, a mishmash of what he's really saying. Like, the trading itself is is bad. It's not that you're doing it inside the temple. It's that you're, you're kind of, because trading is kind of, it's inherently immoral, right? We don't realize this, but we think of it no. as like, you know, it's supply and demand, isn't it, right? So for example, if I've got the food and you come to me with no food, I can charge you whatever price I want because you have no food. And in, in the game, that's fine. That's because that's within the rules of the game, isn't it? To make profit. But morally, that's not okay. That's so, the rules of the game that we created, or in but, this case that we have garnished over the thousands many thousands of years that we've had to do to survive not having the technology to subsist why don't you play the game but it's it's one of those things though isn't it where it's kind of it's a twisted sentiment of kind well, of like oh well why the, are you in a position with no food though did you put yourself in that position or did misfortune visit you well, I suppose it comes down. It do, it doesn't matter about like where that comes from. In the essence of the price shouldn't change, because if someone runs to you and says, "Well, hey, I'm I'm starving," and you go, "Okay, before I feed you, why are you starving? Are well, you starving wait, wait, because wait. you're an no, idiot? Are you starving how, how because you're actually starving?" Come to you with that same story. Yeah. Because well, yeah. You, I, I if suppose it's the tenth time, and if they've done it to themselves, <laughs> then you aren't helping them. But I mean, if the price was all, always kind of set. If you didn't increase the price based on somebody's need, then you wouldn't have to face that moral dilemma. If somebody came if to you, moral say, dilemma, you something. Let's say you needed something swept up, and he needed to be fed, and you said, "Listen, sweep that up," because this is the ninth time you've showed up asking for food. Do this for me first, and yeah, then but, I'll feed you. But Sean, yeah, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Hold on, hold on, Sean, you're coming from an urban New York environment where there is enforced <laughs> scarcity on purpose, and you can also look and see. Imagine if you're like you, a bold entropy enforces scarcity. Yeah, but the thing is, it's a beautiful thing. The entropy also always enforces abundance. In the There's always abundance in for a rat and for a cockroach in New York City because entropy does enforce scarcity, but it also enforces abundance if you know how to exploit right. entropy. But if the man is enforcing scarcity upon himself, you've got to say, do me a favor right. before I do you yeah. a favor the night no, you're, 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 you're being Otherwise, Taoist. You're That's helping. fair. That's yeah, actual, no, but to be fair, it was, I think it was like misunderstanding truth. the point that I was making. Like, well, hold on, is, I want to say, I, I want to say, if you have, no, if no, you have, a, if you have a natural environment, what? if everything, if your whole city Who was planned with, if your whole city was planned with, with fruit trees everywhere, there wouldn't be a problem. There'd be fruit, food there everywhere. There'd be a right? wasp problem. <laughs> okay. There are wasps. Yeah, no, I, I, what, what I'm trying to say is, is not. I'm not saying if somebody comes to you with no money. And you have to feed him. That's that's out of the question. I'm just saying, if somebody comes to you with the same money, right? 
we have a society where it's acceptable to say, well, actually, you look like you're really hungry. So even though you're offering me the exact money that costs for this pasty, I'm actually going to say the pasty is now double the price because you look like you really need it. That's the point I'm getting at. No, it's yeah, the that's immoral that's 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 question of free Yeah, will. yeah, which is something that we have in society. It's called supply and demand. <laughs> so you have right, to, yeah, yeah you, you can go into the nuances. Yeah, if there's a genuine scarcity, if yeah, if if the water has run dry, then of course the water is going to be more valuable. And th but but it that's is weird that we learn something. It's weird that we have <laughs> scarcity at all because it doesn't have to exist, right? Like there's no the reason moment that yes. scarcity exists, it's because in this case. A human wants to get more than they freely could get without it. No, I mean, yeah, I'd agree. Scarcity, I don't, we have not progressed beyond scarcity. That is yeah, an insane we need, concept. We need, we need to have, we need to, if we progress beyond at least having, every, and this is like the Afro China model, is if everyone has access to a certain amount of rice a day, like UN amounts of food a day, then you've kind of done your job to keep them from robbing people as much as you can. Like you, if they're going to destroy the society, it's no longer on you because you've at least placated. Like, and again, with this idea that if you don't feed the poor, the poor might rob you. If you don't, uh, if you have potholes in the street and in, in the poor section of town, your rich kids might play with the poor kids and fall in those potholes. So you oh, have to it's take not care about of the... feeding the poor. You have to keep them busy too, because if you just give them a meal, they'll go out and get and get start getting themselves. Well, into that's some what I mean about trouble. edible landscapes. Edible landscapes are great because if you want food, you have to go pick it. You know. No, because then the squirrels will pick it. I just want to make a. I just want to make a point before we run come. out of time, <laughs> that until we have the history, where we all have experienced, basically the worst that humanity can offer, unfortunately, an actual recorded history of it. You know, not just speculation. You know, we're not going to know how to act as uh, intelligent species. I think we're still in the kindergarten space of intelligent species. But to be fair, I think we're we're actually digressing, like away away from <laughs> what we originally wanted to go for. But is in like. Um, we're de-evolving as people. I I was noting this as I was watching an it's older current, comedy. Yeah. You know, you must have watched Only Fools and Horses. Uh, some of you maybe. No one. Uh, a little bit. Only fools and horses. <laughs> English as fuck. It is very English, but it's it's old, right? It's and as they're talking in it, right, one of the jokes is is talking about Christopher Wren, and Christopher Wren is a very obscure character to the modern age. But I was I was oh, thinking like, whoa, that's a that's a smart joke. And obviously, in in the sixties or whatever, sixties to eighties, people understood these jokes, you know, about Christopher Wren, who Christopher Wren was. And and nowadays, we won't know who Christopher Wren is. I didn't know about no it until I read a book by Robert Shaw. I did an interview on my channel with him, and I learned all about it from there. So you know, I'm not being a snob here. I genuinely had no idea about this. But when you you realize that people in the past, they had a much bigger knowledge of history, you know, than we do now. They, on a general scale, I'd say people about 50 years ago were more educated than we are. Uh, well, like there was the, a lot less culture to consume 50 years ago when there was only what two billion. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, when you when you don't Think have a million it, episodes of like cowboy, TV to the, watch. The pirate, the archetypes of, of of 500 years were still constantly in the in the, in the front we of everyone's We could get a mind. laser with a camera that knows what insect is good and bad and which squirrel is good and bad, and we could zap them or kill them. If they're bad insects or if they're just like squirrels you don't want on your trees. Do you think God have... would be okay with that? <laughs> just one that upstate. What do we have to do to keep the squirrels from eating all the fruit so that he can have an edible landscape no, in New York City? Because then the fruits Luke. will rot. Because they're not preserved. Well, not, I like rats. They don't grow in a jar with I'm salt. not cleaning up Bushwick, right? Orbit. I'd rather have rats. The idea here from what I can see is that we strive and we always strive. And that the moment that we do not strive, we are God. But you know, Sean, you made a great point, like about the there was less to consume. So yeah, fifty years ago, you would just sit there and you'd you'd be like, "All right, I may as well read this book on the geography of everything." You know what I mean? So people even were the, smarter. Even the retellings were reusing the same archetypes for the past six hundred years. Look at the Scooby Doo ghosts half of them are characters from books that are at least two three hundred years old yeah 
I it's mean, just because we, there was so much less. That's because and Scooby Doo's about real ghosts. Really they're they're always they're always trying to tell you that these real ghosts are fake, but they're actually real. Like, and then now in the new Scooby Doo, you know, like most of the ghosts are real. I remember the first time I saw real ghosts on Scooby Doo, besides like the thirteen what? ghosts of Scooby Doo was uh, Shaggy Doo, was Scrappy Doo. Um, when there you was, realize that, that that the content that they're getting comes from history, and that there's really not that much to go on. Dude, remember the African Slaves episode? There's like a whole movie episode no. that came out in like 2007 where they go to Atlanta and then they find all these African <laughs> slaves that are actually dead because they were drowned on the boats. And it wasn't just a bunch of like people no, in no, blackface no. or something? It wasn't, it wasn't BLM. It was literally black slaves that Africans had been drowned. And then they were literal ghosts. How, it was I amazing. I it tastefully enough that nobody got mad about it because I did not hear about that. No. It was like 2007 or 2004. It was a long time ago. So Oh, that was back it. when you could literally say the N-word on daytime television and get away yeah. with it. Like, oh, my God. Like, they were literally pushing racism constantly between 2002 and 2007 on every single – network that is now the most woke like sanitized garbage all day like they oh, were yeah, literally DJ. like Chappelle show mencia all that bullshit all of that was viacom like come on yeah you think culturally they were trying to push racism so that they would get us out like sick of it like they were like hey aren't we tired of it like maybe that was the point no, it's, it's always divide man it's because at the moment we're at this point in our lives where i think the internet you know just really exploded particularly in that period that you were talking about sean and i think they needed to keep this constant battle going you'll see yeah. it now i mean you guys might not use reddit as much as i do but i can't help but scroll through it whenever i you know okay. have a second free and i noticed the amount of stuff that is definitely focused on gender gender wars there's a lot of stuff aimed at you know because obviously i'm a male so i'll get that that stuff pointed to me and it's, oh. it's always stuff you know uh, look at this woman, how awful she's, you know, treating this guy. And that's the vibe they're trying to push yeah. is this that, that women are just, you know, no, uh, they're always immediately, yeah, because they they're trying to cause this with the racism, sexism, blah 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 online. And it originally started getting to me when I thought it was an actual reflection of how the world was becoming. And then I realized, wait a second, these are very small, isolated incidents, and it's just about, they're just reporting more on the background noise of the bullshit that shouldn't be going on and it shouldn't be going on but it wasn't increasing in frequency it was just increasing in frequency of reporting and i sat there and i was like this is designed to do two things distract me and piss me off so i'm just gonna go on the fitness subreddit and learn how to lift weight and that, <laughs> yeah doing that was a lot better for me than sticking with that bullshit yeah no 100 i agree with you because that's the whole thing is aimed at dividing you know it's because if they keep us in pockets, yeah. if they keep us fighting each other in these little segments like Andreas has us, look, in our little four boxes, right? How dare you? How dare you? Exactly. Having our little debates and all the people watching, right? There we go. Unified China. That's what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> well, really, we're more like the Scooby gang. Yeah. But well, yeah, exactly. The point is, is that they want us divided because uh, <clears throat> ap apes together strong, right? Yeah, yeah no, I, I actually... I dated the, the niece of uh, someone we've discussed earlier in this podcast. I'm not going to mention who. And she was one of those like extreme left wing woke girls. And it was really hard to even have a genuine relationship with her because every time there was something that happened in the news that bothered her, somehow it was my fault because I'm a white guy, even though I'm Jewish and Puerto Rican. Uh, it was really, <laughs> really frustrating. <laughs> and I tried to explain to her, like, hey, you know, I don't just support Israel just because, you know what I mean? Like, I understand that they do some things wrong, but you can't even discuss that. Everything just has to be what's going on right here and now in this country. Meanwhile, we've got it better in this period in geography than pretty much anyone else in history. It really it was it was impossible to actually have a conversation with the girl. So it was the divide and conquer has has taken root. And yeah, well, I, I think, yeah, the, the Israel Palestine is a great one, isn't it? Because it's such a divider that it can immediately make you think, like, oh, I don't want to talk to this person anymore because they, they believe in this. They are the devil. You know what I mean? They, they are the worst yeah. person I've ever met because they believe the opposite on me on this. And the thing is, is that it, the emotion side of it is completely justified because that's whichever side you support, people are dying. So you are justified no yeah. matter what you believe. It, you know what I mean? It, does, it doesn't matter. As long as that uh, the core is your motivation, then you are you technically You can support justified. the existence of a state and say that it does things that are not totally correct in your book. You know what I mean? Like, I live in the United States. 
I love this country and I think it should continue existing. There are things that it does that I really don't like. And I think it's government and people are different. And I think you Israeli can say that about people. Israel, Palestine, yeah. Ukraine, Russia, everything. You know, Got a lot of Israeli Israeli probably people sure. there who really depend on the existence of their nation and probably would not like it to stop existing. And they also would probably like it to stop doing things that probably threaten its own existence. Yeah, it's like, really I, I'm I'm of the personal opinion that like at this point the entire world has already been consolidated as one giant nation. We just don't know about it. No, it's, yeah, done, yeah, it's, it's done via corporations <laughs> and finances because in yeah. if you look at World War Two, that's when they realize like, oh my god, these guys can have wars and we can fund both sides and they still don't care. You know what I mean? And that was kind of where it came from. And I think that you look now at these Illuminati groups, people make big deals about that, but it is true in the essence that like the borders are only there to keep the conflicts going. The conflicts are, are there to keep the, uh, the kind of the supply chains strained. And the reason is, is because now, it, it, though, it, it, it's all about the supply yeah. chain. Like mm. they're just directly attacking economics. Oh, hundred percent. And it boils down to a guy called Thomas Malthus, right? So Malth uh, Malthusism is this kind of idea that if you allow humans to just have whatever they want, they will over uh, they will overpopulate, and then they will strain the supply chains. Yeah, this is the guy, and uh, they'll sort of strain the supply chains, and they'll inevitably cause you know, the, the entire system to collapse. And therefore, they thought that it was upon them to be able to create situations like war, famine, disease, etc., to cull populations because in the long term, they're actually saving the species. So you can see how this enters into, you know, real dark territory when you think that oh, you yeah. if you're a rich person that controls, uh, I don't know, Walmart, for example, and you read this and you think, my God, I have a duty to save America by starving the population. That's essentially what these guys were believing in the 18, 1900s. And still to this day, they think it's on them to, to control us via wars. And that's why they're sending people to the meat grinder in Ukraine just to keep uh, Russia is funneling its, its young people to not, you know, not strain the supply chain. And that's the way I see it's it anyway. Crazy. Because this proves right here. First of all, I want to say something about the economic thing I said before. But that graph you just showed proves that being in phys good physical shape is worth more than a fucking million dollars. Because if you really need food in that situation, all you got to do is be faster and stronger than the guy next to you. You got to be able to get to it first and hold on to it. That's it. But what you said about the we're all one big country under a big economic divide was like if you really look at the way the wars are going right now, we've got the Red Sea, the Black Sea, and the South China Sea. It's all about attacking shipping vessels. There's nobody's attacking civilian populations anymore. The last time that happened was Hiroshima. And uh, in, when a nation did that. 9-11 well, is the last Suez time Canal. a terrorist group did that. Suez um, Canal. On a major Suez scale. Suez but Canal's pretty weird and some of the things going on in the... That's the, the, that's the, the, the Black mm -hmm. Sea. Oh, sorry, the Red Sea. Oh, what was the you know, what was the limit of the never mind doesn't matter but yeah the the, the war is all about like this it, like, if we were to call the conflicts going on around the world right now world war three it would be a bunch of economic rather than geographical conflicts yeah i think the water will end up still being a geographical con like the the this is why pepsi was so important with rockefeller in trying to make sure that they had um nuclear tankers and kalishnikovs and the Did ability to get through their, pirate water their... Didn't they give up their fighter, their, their aircraft carrier, Pepsi? Did they do that? That's too bad. I'm sure they they're the way ones cooler. that got it, and then it was like, we can't, we can't, like a country owed them money and then handed them an aircraft carrier and like a bunch of military equipment. They're like, we don't want to be a corporation with military. We're going to give this to the United States and like take the money, something like that. Um, I, I don't know. Pepsi, I, I, Pepsi, Pepsi had for like a long time, like they had the largest, uh, sixth largest navy. Um, but I think that there's something they, they work with another company, like PepsiCo works with another company now in order to do that because of the piracy issue, because they don't want to be the corporation killing other pirates and stuff looks bad. Right. So now they're like, Hey, we're not the one doing it. <laughs> I was gonna say, spe company. speaking of this uh this stuff going back to world war ii have you ever looked into like the hindem uh hinderberg and all that kind of stuff about whether or not oh, the people who survived were the ones that didn't jump yeah <laughs> because that, well, it just slowly sank to the ground it was just fire <laughs> was on top 
<laughs> well, I was I was going to say more into the uh, the political aspects of it, right? So obviously you had all these cameras there ready. Yeah, if you look at the 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 transcripts imagine, of the guy, imagine that, having the Empire State Building having an airport in it, that would be amazing. Well, this is what I'm right. This is what I'm saying. So if you look at what happens in 37 1937 the hindenburg crashes and it goes all over america right before before this before this the these zeppelins and blimps and different types had been floating over american cities they've been floating over they do tours of america right german citizens regularly came from hamburg to new jersey on the zeppelins then they could fly to south america they'd go to south america and one of the pilots that would fly these things after this he said that it was just definitely sabotage because uh, the reason he says is that when he was flying this exact model and a different one to south america he got hit by lightning in thunderstorms and absolutely nothing happened and obviously yeah, there was the no official oxygen inside of it well, the, the official story is obviously that this is static energy that's just I mean, it's probably it. just it's diesel, diesel engines, but though. The diesel engines were set fire. Lysol, that's a lot of fucking flammable shit in your hand in a metal tin. You could zap that with your fingers on, you know, rub your finger on the carpet and zap that can all day. There's no oxygen in the can. It's not going to explode because there's no there's no chemical reaction to take place. Ex exactly. And if you look <laughs> at World War One, right? World War One, the 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 London raids, right? There was there was a Zeppelin raid in the UK at least every week for mm -hmm. for most of the war. Okay, about fifty two through one year, and that means Zeppelins flying over. They've got artillery on the ground shooting at them. They've also got the planes. Fair enough, they you weren't advanced. They were still they were still propeller planes, but they had big guns. You know, the dude on the back. Think of the mummy when they're flying that plane. You know, mm -hmm. Wilson. Yeah, the guy shooting. If you and when I was thinking of that, was, especially I was playing Battlefield One, and I was like, wait a minute, how the hell are these bullets not making that thing just instantly go? Pow? You know what I mean? It's getting shot to pieces. It's got holes in it. Yeah, it's still going. I thought, well, maybe it's part of the game. Then I look into it and I go, oh, well, they were actually part of war. Why would they have these things as part of war if one plane could just fly past, shoot a couple holes in it, and it goes, fucking crashes in the distance. You know what I mean? There's, there'd be no point. So you've, you've got to think that they were reasonable. And, and then it turns out that obviously after... 1837 uh, sorry 1937 the the americans did carry on using them until the end of the the 50s and the, the one of the best things that they were good at was sinking submarines so mm -hmm. the british for example they quickly designed their own in the first world war because they realized oh like they were tiny and they were useless but they had bombs on board they could see the submarines if they were high enough uh, which they had to be that high to shoot the ships so they could see them and they'd drop drop bombs on them and there's you know there's recorded cases of these things uh flying in particular in world war ii as convoy companies you know because if they had a zeppelin or whatever you want flying with them the submarines couldn't couldn't come up because they know they'd get spotted and then bombed so you you start to think like wait a minute why did these things just suddenly disappear and we don't really hear much about them well it turns out that obviously these things were the They're fastest small. way well, they were the fastest thing across the trans uh, across the Atlantic. Bombs, so they were fastest they, way across the transatlantic. They were Blinter. the first drones. Blinter's yeah, and, and majorly used by Lockheed, all the major military. That's like, sick. And yeah. and two years, right? Two years after the Hindenburg her. crash. So bearing in mind, the Hindenburg crashes in 1937, and then <laughs> the the final one is decommissioned in 1939. The same model. The um, so they were like, yeah, these are useless. We'll get rid of them. Well, guess what? Boeing released their first plane that can make it across the Atlantic. No in way. Exactly. Yeah, Boeing yeah, released I mean, think it. About it though. Like those things were massively threatened by planes. Like all you, like I bet if you pierced a, a Hindenburg a Hydrogenberg with a, 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 a an oxygen candle, that thing's gonna go down. Yeah, well, probably yeah, but like the, 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 these ones are especially hard to puncture and especially when they're made up of bubbles on the inside so if you pop the outside there's more bubbles on the inside now but why like, man the thing when you have radio control also because that so was the germans the germans were using time. the germans were using like television before we were using television for rocket control and everything but the idea of having um it, yeah the idea of having uh people being brought back and forth i mean like before one person flew across 
the Atlantic, right. 40 people had been taken across the Atlantic or 140, <laughs> you know. You've got to remember as well, so going back to what I was saying about Boeing had suddenly come in, right? Boeing is an arm of the military industrial complex. Okay, so we oh, know yeah. that for a fact, right? Boeing come in, um, and, and like this a, this is a big difference as well, because most of the American and US planes use petrol. And obviously, we know that the petrol dollar, et cetera, goes on to become a big thing. The American you petrol, uh, you mean sorry. gasoline or petroleum? Because like well, jet fuel petroleum is a little bit different from the, the gasoline you put in your car. Point is, yeah, no, not, I'm pretty. Yeah, so I'm pre uh, I can't remember the exact terminology for it. But it's, it's essentially, uh, yeah. Um, and the Germans were using I mean, obviously jet fuel they longer were, chain actually. But well, the Germans were more into their natural gases and yeah. obviously going into their diesel oh. stuff, right? So this is the kind of aspect of it, which is. When the Hindenburg crashes, Germany has just um, annexed, you know, the Rhineland. I can't remember exact dates, but it's moving in, moving into Czechoslovakia, um, and it's you know it's Sean, soon going to do all its a, business. The right? German, the German Nimza crafts. Germany was working, and all these Germans all over the world were working on these gas-powered electromagnetic. I was crafts. about to ask. These things were running on fucking natural gas. Well, they I, as far as I understand, natural gas and diesel are two opposite ends of the petroleum spectrum, and natural gas is a much lower. A lot of the time, they, they a lot of time they were these were far more intricate than you can imagine. Some of them would use micro diesel engines in order to produce. Are these engines made of fucking aluminum? Uh, Boiler? there are all, there are there's all kinds of different materials involved. I think a lot of times they're using paper and using you know like these mm -hmm. uh, propellers and things are ultra light. But then, oh, these yeah. are hot air powered. Yeah. Hot okay. air, These and gas, nice, like chemical gas that ah. also rises, but they also have uh, they also have propellers lighter than aircraft. Well, but they're also like anti, uh, well not anti, but they're re magnetic. They they well, they change the their molecular magnetic than aircraft. It is it's subject to drifts drafts yeah so, so what they do is they create an electromagnetic static, which then they can control which direction the electromagnetic static is pulling ionic okay. particles. And then that pushes it different directions, right? And this is what's going on right now, like ionic uh, gliders. Um, they have a surgery making... robot like that. It's this little tiny steel tab. It has no moving parts inside of it, and they just spin yeah. it around through these, your body with a magnet. These new ionic gliders have magnets all along these strips here, like, and these are ribbons down in there. And each one of these things, they pick up on ions because of electromagnetic static, and they lift. So it's a solid-state vehicle. There's absolutely no moving parts. But it does lift, and it keeps flying for weeks at a time. S23 said something in the chat, sacred geometry. Sacred geometry is cool, but it's not anything mystical. It's literally just algebra with shapes instead of numbers. Yeah, I will say that while you're and on. And the DMT. reason it's sacred is because it allowed us to unlock the secrets of the fucking universe before we had the Arabic number system. Like, we couldn't do long division without sacred geometry because Roman numerals suck at that. Well, but yeah. It's a, I, uh, it's, oh, go ahead. Oh, no. just, well, I was going to say just to finish off what I was saying about the the airships is if you yeah. look at the way that it um, that it happened, you know, obviously before the the Hindenburg, right? Uh, this is the the biggest way of travel, and the Germans are known as the big boys. Now the differences between like the American models, they I think they were the K models. These were called blimps. Now. I presume people don't know the difference, but a blimp is one that has no framework. It's just all, uh, you know, soft. Yeah, it's a balloon, yeah. essentially, yeah. Whereas Zeppelins, for example, are semi-rigid or rigid. So they actually have and framework. And Zeppelin is yeah. a little bit of pizza dough fried up and dipped in sugar at the at the carnival. Yeah. I mean, arguably, yeah, right. arguably it's less and less important these days because Zeppelin was the name of a guy and he's dead. And they just kind of generically have stolen the name Zeppelin because he doesn't. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, more, it's more of a brand, isn't it? It's, it's kind of like a Zeppelin functionally. But functionally, functionally, the idea of an airship now usually has a bit of both. And especially because of nano aerogels, the idea that if you puncture this thing, there's just you're it's like a boogie board you're not going to get through the next bubble because it's just bubble after bubble after bubble yeah yeah and well it's it's kind of like with you said about the name it's kind of like jet ski like jet ski is uh i'm pretty certain it's a model isn't it it's not actually that aerogel bubbles are essentially framing it's just a new kind of frame technology that's beyond metal framing i would be amazed but if they, they didn't have like a gooey liquid layer that automatically ran into a crack that would yeah, be before, formed for the sure. point is, is that there's definitely some kind of conspiracy here because you got to remember the war kicks off with Germany officially, uh, you know, nine, 1939. They know that it's coming. They know the war is coming. And the Hindenburg is the, the main way of crossing. You got to remember there's a huge German contingent in America. Remember, there was a lot of uh, Nazi stuff. One of the things people won't know is one of the Nazi headquarters was actually in New York in, in right. Times Square. Um, 
that's that's how ingrained the the Nazism was. And I think uh, wasn't it Bush's grandfather was originally Her- done for doing money laundering for the Nazis he was through one of these companies. Gold, yeah. Well, who was? Yeah. It? Like, yeah. Well, exactly. This is the point. So they they were very ingrained, but. Boeing came, comes up, doesn't it, with this plane to get you across the Atlantic at the exact same time that all the news media are there filming perfectly for the crash of the Hindenburg, right? Obviously, that gets scrapped at exactly the same time the planes come in. The military keep on using them for another 20 years because, you know, they're fine for the military, but not fine for the public, you know? So then we get put in experimental planes. And obviously, if you look at today, Planes are great compared. I mean, not if you look at any of the recent boats. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't want to but... spend four weeks going over uh, the East Coast <laughs> to get to Florida. Well, exactly. But the point is, is we don't know where that technology kind of would have gone because at the same time, uh, you know, people enjoy going on cruises, don't they? Um, it, that's a long journey when they don't have to. And I think if you had a real safe mechanism for, for doing this, I think people would really enjoy it. And yeah, I might be wrong. I have no idea on the subject, but I feel like there was definitely a kind of financial reason to replace the current German kind of fuel. Because remember, all all the factories well, and all the main... I, I think I know why this happens. Hold on. Can, can, can I interrupt? Yeah, you feel free. Um, the I think that... All right. If you have this this war effort going on and you want to support these amazing new flying machines that Boeing is building, you're going to want to have as much of your population paying into that rather than into the one that they feel is a little bit more comfortable and familiar to them. Right. So you're going to want to assassinate that industry so that you can really build up that war effort extra hard and make it look like it was naturally happening based on the will of the people. As well, though. Yeah, exactly. And remember that the the Zeppelin itself is, uh, even if they have their own blimps, it was a symbolism of German manufacturing. So to have German manufacturing floating over your cities whilst you're at war with Germany and you're supposed to be better than Germany does not look good. So you that's a huge reason, because remember, just before this, they used to do these tours where they'd fly their best Zeppelins across the United States, visiting all the major cities and people would go to the cities to see the Zeppelin fly over. It'd be a Mm -hmm. huge event. And for centuries centuries before it. For centuries before it, people were doing that with airship, like air balloons, just regular air balloons were landing in cities. So exactly, and now, now, they're, machines, now they're doing it with their big military one ones. And don't forget, they can bomb as well. They've got bombers; they can push bombs out the bed. They, they, and people have debated whether you know some of the fires that took place in America in the late eighteen hundreds had possibly been started by Zeppelins pushing out tank. Yeah, uh, you know, because if you look dropping at the, cigarettes, come on. Dropping yeah, nobody had a yeah, it's back then to point it out. Yeah, I mean, it's a crazy theory, but I love it. Um because yeah. if you look at what the Germans did in World War One, they there's one dropped in Liverpool. Look it up. It's the Liverpool incendiary dropped by a Zeppelin. Um and it when you see this, you'll realize this is what they were dropping on people. And you go, oh, because now you might understand why cities could have had fires if you had this technology. Um it's like your original harp. Uh Try well, and now it's up. Australia's fault that America burns every year. There, you hear about here we go. If, I think you could they see said it there. There's a bunch of eucalyptus trees as a joke, and real. Then they they knew, but we knew that a hundred years later, those eucalyptus trees would start burning themselves, literally, like Metal flaking thing. their bark off, just ready oh, wow. because that's how they reproduce. Crazy. No, no, that's a shit. That's a shit one. Go back. There's a bigger one. Oh, um, you'll on. see it. Was it was on that page. I'll find it. I'll find it. Find it. Where did you go? uh this it's guy? that thing there the bucket looking thing right so uh, they had these and they had bigger ones but um they drop these exactly tag things that yeah yeah they drop they drop incendiary it down and it yeah it just set fire to everything a big match inside brutal and yep. that bottom piece is the center of gravity so it's always pointed straight down and as soon as it hits the ground that screw drops into it strikes the match and lit, lights the fire yep that's pretty sweet well, yeah. I got I to gotta do my next show, so is there any more closing thoughts that you want to point out? Because we should do this again, though. Luke, I love you, and we should actually do this like, weekly. We should talk about Hindenburgs all the time. It's great. <laughs> I'm incredibly well, yeah. honored to be on a stream with you, Ancient Historia. Just want to oh, say that you. outright. So, thank you, man. Yeah. I'm honored to be on a stream with you, too. Yeah, Dude. it's been fun. We'll do it again next week if you're free. But also, I'll talk to – because I'm doing a Europa thing. Maybe I can – I'll slip you the stream to that, too. We just keep on – Keep it on. 
Right, well, anyway, thanks guys. Chasing all my dreams, aiming to thrive, even when it's tough. I won't let them slide, always keep my goals inside, goals inside.